Today, we're taking it back in time a little bit out to 2008 in Phoenix, Arizona with our 1987 NASCAR. So we have a double back in time today. I'm glad to be back with you all for season four of AMX1 NASCAR. I am Kevin Garcia and I'm joined with Somil. Somil, how are you doing today? All very well, Kevin, especially after hearing that we're going to do two races of NASCARs, the 1987 ones at the good old Phoenix. Now, that's what we're talking about. No longer do we have to race on the new one where we have the sort of mixed in start finish straight, which probably isn't the best in the world. Now we can go back to the good old setup and that's going to be a ton of fun, if not a ton of carnage. So yes, of course, Land, we only have two weeks left in our season this week, or sorry, for season four, we only have two weeks left of races until we are going to be officially crowning our AMX1 NASCAR champion. And it has been a battle so far all season long between Connor Healy and Facundo Rago. But it looks like today, as long as Facundo Rago can stay ahead of Healy, or as long as Facundo Rago has a clean race, he may very well be walking out of here, your AMX1 NASCAR champion. But before we get into today's action, it should be a good one. Like we said, we are at the old legacy Phoenix Raceway circa 2008 in the even older legendary 1987 NASCAR vehicles, which of course, for all of our NASCAR fans out there, you know that these cars are some of the fastest that there have ever been, easily going over 200 miles an hour, which we may not quite see that speed today, but we will absolutely be seeing a lot of speed, possibly a lot of carnage, as this older one, the banking isn't quite as grippy as the newer Phoenix Raceway. But again, before we get in, we have a few things to go over today, just how the season has been going so far and how these races are stacked up. So again, AMX Global Season 4 is coming soon to an end. We've loved having everyone here all season long. <clears throat> we started it back in January 27th and we're going to be going through April 21st with a season prize pool of $20,000 and next level racing gear. So here's how the races have been going. If you follow in along, you already know. But for those of us joining us, we will go over one more time of a qualifying of 20 minutes before we go into heat one which will be a top 15 reverse grid followed by that heat one of 20 minutes going into another top 15 reverse grid and finally that second heat of 20 minutes so i know that top 15 reverse grid has been a fan favorite shaking the grid up just a little bit so for those of you that are joining or want to drive Driver cams are required. You can find all of the information via our AMX Discord or online at our AMX, AMX website. Payouts are every $100 paid out every month. So once you hit that $100 threshold, you can be expecting a check in the mail. Race days, Tuesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So we race here three times a week and we have two races every single time we race. So you want to get in on the action, feel free to go to amxrace.com. We'd love to have you here. The more, the merrier here out on the racetrack. And like I mentioned, Tuesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays every week. So for AMX1, we start at 5.50 p.m. GMT, followed shortly after the AMX10 races at 7.20 p.m. GMT. So that too, if you're living perhaps around England, that area, these are going to be your local times. If they're not your local times, feel free to do a quick search online and convert it. Again, we love to have as many people as we have here. We, we have tons of people all around the world all coming together. It's been a great season so far. So now, <clears throat> talking about money, this is how we have our current prize pool for AMX1. So for qualifying, you do get money for qualifying as well. So first place gets $7, followed by second place, $5, third, fourth, sorry, third place, $4, followed all the way down into 15th place. Going into that heat number one, the winner of heat number one also $7, second, five, third, fourth, and so on, as well as heat number two. And that person that nails the fastest lap during each heat will also get an additional dollar added on with a total prize pool of $100 for each race. So again, 
you can see on the screen if you want to get in here and win some of that prize money we'd love to have you get in here challenge these guys a little bit and of course going on from that we do have your amx top 12 drivers starting in first place we have diego viriel de leon who is been very consistent showing up for nearly every race that shows your consistency absolutely pays out diego a fan favorite here in second place mauricio lozano third place facundo rago who is i believe our current points leader which we will get to in a little bit number four lloyd Renier in fifth place connor healy sixth place gerardo ramos seventh simon seminaro who's been killing it in the ACC races. Yes, we do have ACC as well as iRacing. In eighth place, we have Lautaro Gaioso. Ninth place, Lucas Werley. Tenth, Roman Pascucci. Eleventh, Leo Mora. And in twelfth, Nico Godoy. So like we said, that is your AMX1 top 12. All of the races combined. But today, what are you are here for? What you came to see? Your AMX1 NASCAR top 10. Which starting in 10th place, we had last week's winner, Josh Perween, sitting down there 24.2 points. 9th place, Leo Mora at 24.4. 8th place, Mateus Machado with 26.6 points. 7th place, Kevin Garcia, 26.7 points. 6th place, Roman Pascucci at 34 points. 5th place, Fabrizio Belzidi with 37.8. 4th place, Diego Viriel de Leon with 71.6 points. In your 3rd place, Lautaro Gaioso with 90.7 points. Second, Connor Healy sitting at 111.5. And like we mentioned earlier, your current pole position, number one seed, whatever you may want to call it, sitting in AMX1 NASCAR. First place going to Facundo Rago with 141.3 points. And of course, like we mentioned, he is very close to win in the championship. So we will have to see how he does today, who is going to challenge him. And like I mentioned, if he has enough points after today's race, he may be walking into your final next week, already a NASCAR champion. But back to today's track info. So Mill, I'll head it back over to you to get a little bit more of what we're going on in today's race. Phoenix Raceway back from 2008. Oh yes, this is the place to be. Now, unlike the old, unlike the new Phoenix rather I would say, this place is a lot tougher to drive because the lines here are far more restricted, which means that passing is going to be far trickier. The grip isn't quite the best in the world and as a driver, you've really got to be on the edge of your car to make sure that things really work out well here. And touch wood, we have the good old start finish to it, which means that a few photo finishes could be coming in right here at Phoenix. But the best part of it all is now it's going to be a very technical challenge for all the drivers. But interestingly, the races are rather short, only around 40 odd laps. So instead of the normal tyre saving that wins you a race at Phoenix, it's mostly going to be all out fast attack all the way through here, which will make it quite a fun challenge considering how the circuit is made and how few overtaking lines you actually have. And then, of course, the car, the 1987 NASCARs. We have an interesting mix actually over here because, in fact, back in 1987, NASCAR weren't even racing at the Phoenix Raceway. They initially started coming here since 1988. But this particular class of car, as we discussed earlier, Kevin, totally chaotic. It, there's a great chance for the drivers to reach really high speed. It's not particularly at the circuit, as you rightly mentioned, but it's a dicey car. It's not a machine that will be as planted as an, on our stable as the new gen NASCARs will be, which means that as a driver, you've got to be far more careful, far more on the limit, far more vigilant of everyone around you. And that essentially means more chaos and more action for all of us, does it not? Of course, absolutely. And like we said, uh, uh, myself being in some of these uh, AMX1 races earlier on in the season, uh, I can tell you, I was out here and believe last time we were in these vehicles, we were out at Talladega, which super fast mm -hmm. track here. It's not going to be quite as fast today as, you know, we only have a one mile track compared to the two and a half at some of these super speedways. But 
that just makes it that much more tricky for these drivers to really be disciplined with their throttle control coming out of some of these corners. We'll have to see, wait and see what happens with these drivers today. But again, we have our drivers are in the qualifying currently right now. So like we mentioned earlier, we do have that 20 minute qualifying time going in. So we will hop on board with our drivers. And we could see today looks like so far we have a couple of people missing. So like I mentioned earlier, we currently had a battle going on all season long between Connor Healy and Facundo Rago. And today it looks like right now Connor Healy is not showing up in the race. So we may possibly see a little bit of different strategy coming out from Facundo Rago today as he may know, hey, I'm not going to have to try too, too hard right now to win the championship. I'm just going to have to play it safe and see as we're looking right here. One of my favorite liveries is from Diego Virial, which is on screen right now, the Los Poyos Hermanos. And being from New Mexico, of course, the Breaking Bad reference there. We love to see all the Breaking Bad references everywhere that we go. <laughs> Complete with the good old pink. Well, at least a fact in the car that, that's that's one thing considering how hot it gets at phoenix arizona at least in real life not virtually but i find it interesting that uh, not many drivers have chosen to qualify only three so far but hopefully more drivers can join in and make it a pretty packed grid on the whole eventually it's a little bit odd because normally there is a seven dollar prize pool available for the winner of qualifying but not many people have chosen to take part in this perhaps this is probably not the most popular car choice track but nevertheless regardless of how many people we have a race is what we are going to have on our hands and be it three people be it 20 regardless of whatever it is phoenix is a good place to come to for a race and and you must know this about the competition in the amx one class kevin particularly with all these drivers when there's a proper prize pool on offer like we do have here things can get pretty intense can't they Oh, absolutely. And I'd say just from being in the races themselves, of course, everyone wants to win that prize pool. But even more than that, it's just having the bragging rights of saying, all right, I know I'm coming out here. I'm racing against these guys and just being able to say, hey, I'm the best of the best or I've been able to win however many races we can. So like we said right now, Facundo Rago being your, your current NASCAR points leader, he has to be feeling you know, I'd say it'd be bittersweet out here today because on one hand, you know, all right, I just have to have clean races for the next couple of weeks and I'm going to be walking out of here with that next level championship prize. But at the same time, you know, as a driver, you also want the competition. You want to have that absolutely knowing I pushed it against the best of the best drivers. We went toe to toe. We went head to head, door to door, and we came out ahead of this. So... <clears throat> Now, of course, on screen as well, um, you can see there, folks, uh, the live timing will periodically pop up throughout the race. Uh, but right now, while we are waiting on our drivers to get through qualifying, um, Sumil, uh, sorry, <laughs> Sumil, how, how excited are you? I know this is a little bit different than some of the races that you have commentated on before. Yeah, this is, this is interesting to say the least because normally oval racing isn't quite my forte, not least the smaller tracks quite like Phoenix because normally when you dip into, dip your foot into oval racing, you normally tend to look at the bigger ones like Daytona or Phoenix, Daytona or Talladega, my apologies. But when you come to a place quite like this, it has a different vibe coming all the way through because no longer is it all about just putting your foot all the way down the throttle and just hoping for the best. This is more about technicalities, as you rightly mentioned. Throttle control, having discipline over your turn and angles. And that is precisely what we can see through the onboard lap of Ivan Rodantas, who currently maintains pole position in this qualifying session. Watch how gentle and how delicate, rather hear how gentle and delicate you have to be on your throttle coming into all of these turns here. And one of the major factors of a track like Phoenix is tire management. But we're not going to have that today, which makes me wonder what sort of racing are we actually going to have? How crazy are these drivers going to get once the green flag drops? And that is something, it takes a bit of imagination for sure, but you only have to see it in real life to actually get to figure out what their approach plans and what their strategies are going to be like now that you take that strategy element away from them, now that it's just all proper go, go, go action, which should be 
fun, to say the least. I, I think we should just wait and watch to see what mood they come out with today. today. Yes, and you had mentioned the, the tire saving, which, again, today looks like uh, we'll only be a little bit over 40 laps. So, you know, these are some quick laps around 30 second laps around this track. Again, uh, it's only about a mile long. So here, being on the legacy course compared to the new course that we have today, the newer course does have a little bit different banking and is a little bit grippier in some sections. So right here, as you can see, uh, Dantes going into the wall oh. just a little bit. That's going to be one thing that these drivers, especially coming out of turns two and four, they're really going to have to be careful not to get into that throttle too early. Because like you can see there, you just step on that throttle just a little bit, you start losing that rear end of the car, and into the wall you will go. So it's a very delicate dance out here at the old Phoenix Raceway. Not to say that the new raceway is much different, especially in these cars. These cars have practically no aerodynamics other than that rear spoiler on the trunk. So outside of that, I mean, these are just huge giant bricks with tons of horsepower flying through the air. Um, but of course, that too, I always like to get on some of these tracks and see what these drivers are going to if I have some time. So this one, like I mentioned, this car combination with this track, it is going to be an absolute interesting race. But as we come to a close here in our qualifying, we're going to go into the heat one. So right now it does look like we only have three drivers, but don't let that fool you. Just because we only have three drivers out here in the roster, we've had some other small rosters before, and we've had absolutely amazing races. So don't let the small field, as we can see there, your Ben Q session winner of Evandro Dantas, laying down a 30.494 second lap, followed closely by Diego Virial in second place and rounding it out in third place, Facundo Rago. So again, Facundo Rago will be now leading at pole position, but it looks like we only have two drivers out behind the pace car currently. So we're getting ready to go green here very soon in heat one at Phoenix Raceway. So with only having two of the three drivers out here today on the racetrack, we will see this should be a very interesting one if Facundo Rago is going to be starting out from the pits. So of course right here we have our current out lap, pace car still out, moments away from going green. And as always, of course, being a NASCAR race, we got to say those magic words, boogity, 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 let's go racing boys. As we have the two drivers currently on the field, getting a great start we see currently right now your fastest lap to the inside we have Dantas and Villarreal looking to hold that outside line but again we are only about we are 41 laps out here in each heat so as of course some of that tire savings will have to come into play not quite like a full NASCAR race in real life but once you start eating through those tires that can absolutely start compromising your line and you have to think as fast as you can adapt to the vehicle as much as possible and on those first couple of laps itself Dantas quite clearly getting the best run off it got a pretty good start on the inside of Diego Villarreal and since then it's been plain sailing all the way through for him now on the whole the entire race would be a matter of keeping your concentration through entirely remember there's not just one race there are going to be two of these heats for each class that we have which means that all the way through even if you make one minor mistake your main drive will be at the most a second second and a half two seconds behind you which in the grand scheme of things isn't too much now essentially what you're going to be playing here is a giant game of tag you make one mistake you maybe twist your ankle or clip the barrier whatever it might be in racing terms you end up being swallowed away by your rival and this being an oval circuit instead of a proper road course one time here and momentum critically could be gone so over the course of 40 laps yes it might just looks like it might just look like two cars going round and round in circles but it's a game of concentration more than anything else and they can't for, they can't afford to lose that critical momentum which is keeping them on right now 
and myself being in the last race that we had these 1987 vehicles we <laughs> of course uh, like we mentioned last time we were in these vehicles we were out at Talladega Speedway which on that course you're hitting 213 214 <laughs> miles per hour so easily over 300 kilometers an hour these vehicles are just absolutely insane um, and that too so <laughs> it is just an absolute riot to be in these vehicles and of course just like any motorsport the faster the vehicle you have these vehicles keep in mind that a lot of these were the reasons why they had to change the NASCAR rules because these vehicles are just getting too dangerous. Those drivers were going too fast. There's too many accidents. So it hit the point of NASCAR having to take a look back and say, all right, this, this isn't well. Of course, we want to always be going faster because the fans love it. The drivers love it. The teams are out here, the engineers building the fastest cars that they can, competing even faster with so many other vehicles out there at the time, of especially Formula One. So whenever you have NASCAR going faster than Formula One on some of those straightaways, but without the safety of the modern vehicles, that was a recipe for disaster that ultimately led to some of the change, which is still very controversial to this day. And even with the current next gen vehicles in NASCAR, there's still a lot of fans saying, you know what? It's not enough power. It's not enough speed, which again, Everyone always wants to go fast, but of course we want to keep these drivers safe. And speaking of these drivers right now, it looks like Dantas so far has been able to get a little bit of a gap ahead. Keep in mind, Dantas was your qualifying uh, pole position. So he did qualify just a little bit over Villarreal. And it also looks like Facundo Rago may just be out for heat number one. He never came out of the pit. So we will have to see what happens there later on? Will he be able to get back here in time for Heat 2? Not sure if he's having some technical issues, but we will have to check in and hopefully see what is going on with him, Samil. Yeah, it's a little bit strange to see Facundo Rago not competing in this one, especially keeping in mind the prize money on offer and also the opportunity for him to just be able to extend what is already quite a decent championship lead over his major right as well so a little bit of a weird one to see him not racing in this one but perhaps he's saving it up for something bigger something different potentially maybe we could get to see him in the amx 10 race coming up later on today but that we shall see but uh, that leaves us with only two of these drivers at least for heat number one remember that after this heat number two will also be coming in soon so facundo rago could be a feature in that one and he doesn't quite need to feature in both of them to A, be able to get a decent bit of prize money and B, also be able to extend his championship lead further on as well. So, keeping in mind the shorter grid, uh, Facundo Rago probably might have just pulled out a smart move actually, just making sure that he's well rested for the second one so that he can just go out there, make an impact in one race and then sit back and chill and watch the others do their stuff in the other one. So, that's, that's what happening with him right now. But it's interesting actually because... We rarely ever get to see any major championship run with these particular cars. And, and you mentioned it so well, these things were beauties of their time that got too fast beyond the point and had to be outlawed for being that quick. And eventually all the changes were made. It's kind of brilliant that we do have them on iRacing time and again for us to be able to just sit back and enjoy, feel what the speed used to be like, at least in part, behind the wheel of a virtual cockpit. But Nevertheless, it's amazing that there are some drivers and some championships keeping these cars alive and the fun of racing these. I've, I've never had the chance, but from all the anecdotes that I've heard from all the drivers who've raced it, including yourself, it seems like quite a handy machine to drive, right? I, I can't imagine what it must be like at any road course, let alone at any tougher circuit like Phoenix. Oh yeah, uh, these ones, like I said, mainly they're known for being super popular, super fast on those super speedways, such as Daytona, Talladega, uh, which we were at last time. And um, so here, being a shorter track of one mile, these drivers, they have plenty of power, but I believe a lot of these guys, you're not gonna really be going much over 150 miles an hour on this track. So it does have a unique layout here at Phoenix, instead of being your typical tri-oval that we see at so many of these NASCAR tracks, Phoenix has a little bit of a difference between turn one and two and turn three and four of course here they call it the dog leg so it has a little bit wider turn going out from here so that one it does 
definitely play into. I love tracks like this where you go into it where it's not going to be exactly the same on one end of the track as it is on the other. We have a little bit of an asymmetrical track here. So, of course, that always plays in as, oh, we get a little bit sliding, and it looks like Dante's just tapping the wall there. So that lead is going to drop down a little bit. He had over a four-second lead right there, and now that gives opportunity for Villarreal to start start catching up as long as he can keep it clean. But again, as you look on the timing on the screen, Villarreal is still also so. Villarreal might have hit that same section right there just barely tapping into the wall and of course once you do that once you get the aerodynamics on the cars and it starts damaging the vehicle that just leaves it so most people only think about the tire wear and the fuel savings but like right there too as you could see going into the wall just tapping in a little bit getting even the slightest body damage now you have to fight that car the entire rest of the race so again as much as this is hey we're having to go as fast as we can around here. We have to save our tires. Now, these drivers are going to have to keep it just that much more consistent throughout the rest of the race now that they're having just a little bit of body damage to these vehicles. And that brings in some proper driver skill. Because all the way through the race, dealing with a damaged car can be quite a pain, especially if there are some alignment issues that could potentially arise from a tap like that. It's a lot of minor changes to your driving, lots of muscle memory that kicks in, and you've got to correct that because the way you turn in at a particular angle, when you've got hundreds and hundreds lap worth of, worth of practice at a particular circuit, suddenly you're going to be changing that because your car's alignment is different. So the angles that you've been carrying in for so many laps then have to be altered, and so does your line. And that must be particularly annoying for all these drivers who have done so many laps around the circuit, practicing and fine-tuning their way out. Now, an interesting part about this particular race is also that the setups are fixed, which means that the drivers, again, have no maneuverability in terms of how the car feels, in terms of ride height and all the other elements that come along with it. This makes it a little more fun, a little more challenging, and let's say a lot more accessible to far more people, people who have actually unfortunately not chosen to be here today, but uh, lastly, it makes it far, far more fun. But also at the same time, for drivers who are seasoned in oval racing, this might end up being such a headbreaker because I can't imagine something like this, Kevin, where I'm used to driving with my own setup, my own way of driving a race car around an oval, and then to be forced into driving a fixed setup. I can imagine that being like, quite a hindrance, right? Because I can't get the best out of my car the way I want it to. And just that lack of dialing in with the car can cause some issues like we did see with Danda's previously. Absolutely. And for a lot of people that just think, hey, these drivers, all they're doing is just turning left. How hard can it be? I mean, you can see right there, the biggest thing as a driver here is shows how these drivers has to be, have to just be able to be adaptable, how they have to be able to get into a rhythm and how that way they have to be able to be just absolutely perfectly precise on here so just like other forms of motorsport as we'll see later on during the amx 10 races and you know all season long here within the nascar as well is that we have <laughs> as be real just tap in the wall again right there um that just shows that hey just because you're only turning left on here doesn't mean that it's not difficult because especially here a lot of this i always say it's like a game of chess all right a lot of this is strategy a lot of it is a mental game so when you're out here Sure, you may just be hey, going on there on the super speedways, stomping on the throttle and just hoping that you can get around the other guys. But here on these shorter tracks, I love them, especially we've seen last week as well. Uh, last week we're at Bristol. So that one is only a half mile track versus a mile here today in Phoenix. But the biggest thing with these cars, they still have enough power, especially how heavy they are. You really have to feather the brakes going in to those corners still making sure that you hit an apex to try and get that perfect line on there so again turning left not always as easy as most people think that it might be uh super speedways a little bit easier most of the time just hey full throttle get around the drivers and hope that you can complete lap after lap after lap with no mistakes but right here 
Diego Villarreal able to close that gap in slightly like we've seen earlier. Dantas had close to a four second gap and it was hovering about 3.8 seconds. So now Villarreal is closing it now less than three and a half seconds. So Dantas is starting to feel the pressure as we're a little bit more than halfway through our race. As you can see the on-screen timing down there in the bottom in the middle through sector one, Villarreal has been consistently faster through that. So if he's able to keep it right there, roughly two tenths of a second to about a quarter of a second, he may be catching up here within the next 10 laps. And there, there too, you can see sector two as well. So looks like Dantas, even though he was faster during qualifying, just having those little bit of mistakes is giving Villarreal that opportunity to slowly reel him in. And it looks like a lot of rear end sliding. We saw that over the last couple of laps with Dantas, with him just getting very, very close towards the edge of the barriers as well. And that could be a problem in the long run because it's notoriously known to be a place, Phoenix that is, notoriously known to be a place in the past that was not very friendly to that upper higher line. To get the maximum out of the car, the lower line was the place to be. So the higher you run, the worse it was for the tyres eventually. And the way Dantas is running right now as well, making a few errors here and there, just slipping and sliding around. When I say errors, it's not that I could have done any better. But then, again, being such a long race, being something that's so challenging with only two drivers and no other lap cars or something else to take your mind away, you're just so dialed into making sure that every single corner works well that you can end up overthinking it sometimes. And that could also be something that happens eventually. It could also be sheer boredom of all things as well because you're just driving into clear air that you have to focus so much on just turning the car in a particular way that you just end up dropping the ball randomly which could be a case as well so for Villarreal it's a matter of just being there being in this sort of margin if he can't go that much faster waiting for Dantas to just make that one mistake which he has been making a few times here and there if a bigger one comes in that could be his shot Stick to the lower line, make sure that the tyres are okay, make sure the throttle control is totally alright, and then, hopefully by the end, the $7 could be yours. So as we can see, of course, from Dantis, um, so when you're on these tracks, and like you mentioned earlier, just leading the entire way, I will say one thing, that it is very easy to start losing focus, because once you don't have anyone right in front of you, it makes it that much easier to just start making the littlest mistakes that we've seen uh, from Dantis. So like we said, two, two big things. One, not having that car in front of you, you have to absolutely set the pace of the race. And with that means if you're trying to get a little bit more aggressive and have those quicker laps, you're going to be burning through those tires a little bit faster than the guy behind you. So again, that too going from qualifying into the main race. You have to slightly change up your line. As we can see now, Villarreal is roughly a second and a half back. So he's more than closed down from a double of that gap. So right there, we have Villarreal looking like he may have Ooh. just made a little bit less mistakes and has been a little bit better on the tire savings as well. So again, those little tiny taps into the wall, you do it a couple different times and that's just it. As we have about 12 laps left in this race so it seemed like Dantas was going to take away with this being the fastest in qualifying and getting ahead early on but that just shows again it's not all about being the fastest driver you have to be extremely consistent which Villarreal has shown all season long he is a very consistent driver and that too so with Dantas in here shaking things up again for those of you just joining us Facundo Rago was in the qualifying earlier on and was unable to come out during Heat 1. So he is out of Heat 1, but is still your current AMX1 NASCAR points leader. So what was a three-way battle now turned into a two-way battle. And with Villarreal catching up, it should make for very interesting last several laps going through out here at Phoenix Raceway. Slow and steady wins the race. That's the story we've been told forever since our childhood. And that is precisely what we're getting to see with Diego Villarreal as well right now. He is not sliding around quite as much as Evandro Dantosida and your leader is. And sure, you might end up leading the first 32 or 35 laps even 
But the one that matters the most is going to be lap number 41. And Villarreal seems to be primed up to do that. Watch his lines. Watch how much more planted his car is. I think the big moment we're waiting for right now, Kevin, is about to come in very, very shortly. I get a feeling Villarreal is going to go past in the next couple of laps because his car looks that much more dialed in and that much more stable and that much more planted than that of his rival, Dantas. And I was just reading chat as it was going by of uh, <laughs> some of these people out here, of course, with a smaller grid, there is less room for crashes. Once we do have, you know, grids of even 10, 15, 20 cars out on the track, especially some of these tracks here where aren't the widest, those guys being really aggressive trying to make moves, that, that leads to a lot of crashes. And I may be a little bit biased here, um, but if you go over to our AMX socials, uh, you can see a crash here that I was in, gone airborne, flying over the car of Diego Viriel. So if you haven't seen that clip, one of my favorite clips, one of my favorite moments of the entire season. So I know we had a few people here in chat too. Of, uh, I've hopped in whenever I can, and I'm not up here in the booth announcing. I still like to hop in here with these guys and do what I can to try and uh, shake things up a bit. But usually, being not as experienced as some of these drivers out here it does end in some pretty great crashes so i've been airborne in this car in i racing it was great for our ben q replay not so great as both myself and facundo rago during that race pretty much ended up <laughs> towards the back of the pack but back to what's going on today if real was able to reel he's only about a tenth he's now getting back onto the bumper of dantas so right now it may have been a little bit of a slow race for roughly 35 laps, but now 35 and on as Villarreal making that inside move is, he's gonna go, looks like he's getting just a little bit squirrely from both him and Dante. So right now side by side as they're going into lap 36, Villarreal looking to have that, but Dante does a great move of being able to go cut back to the inside and hold back onto the first place. But like I said, folks, remember, we still have six laps to go here. Villarreal has been reeling him in over the last 20 laps or so, been doing a great job. So we should expect as long as both of these drivers keeping it clean, it's gonna be a battle all the way until the checkered flag. And just watch the opponent cam. Watch how Diego Villarreal is doing his best sliding the car all the way through. You saw how much steering lock he had to put in just to correct the car when he was on the inside of Dantas. Now, he's choosing to go to the outside line. Something tells me he's got far more life left on that rubber to be able to do that with that much confidence. Here, Villarreal is realizing that time is of the essence. He only has five or more laps to make that big move, even though he is the faster car. This is where Phoenix, in all of its beauty, comes in its glory. Because at this circuit, what is the outside line? There is no outside line for you to pass on. It's just not that quick. So Dan does theoretically, if he's smart about the lines he chooses, even though he might not have as much rubber or as much confidence in his car, he could end up winning it, even though he is the slower driver on track, quite clearly. This is where the tactics come into play. Sure, it might be only two-car race, but the chess moves that, are, that both of these drivers are playing against each other, oh, they are well worth watching. And again right here, Villarreal back to the back bumper of Dantas. So as we can see from the onboard camera, Villarreal is taking a little bit later enter, entry into these lines. So that allows him to get a little bit better straight away, a little bit more on the throttle sooner. And like we said, right now during the race, at this point, your tires are starting to wear. So that rear end just really sliding out. So Villarreal has been doing his best to keep that tire saving all heat long. And now it is finally paying off. But again, we only have two laps left to go. So Villarreal will have to look to make that move if he wants to get that P1. Again, right here, we're back into lap 40 of 41 out here at Phoenix Raceway looking as Villarreal is closing in on Dantas. And right here, he looks like he's gonna go for the inside move. Will he be able to hold it off? He he is, he's by his door. So right now, coming out of it and through the dog leg, Villarreal just being able to keep that a little bit more. And here, the inside line Ooh. is a little bit faster. So, whoo, door to door, Dantas on the outside as Villarreal looks like he will be going in with the checkered flag into first place. So Villarreal now, 
white flag. Last lap, Viriel was behind all race long, able to take it out on the last lap by passing Dantas. But don't count Dantas out. Like we said, we still have a couple more turns here to go as Dantas looking to make up any inch that he can of Viriel. But it looks like Viriel, his strategy early on paid off as he's coming into turns three and four. Oh. Dantas going very wide on the outside. Looks like he might have been into the wall again. Unfortunately, looking to just scrub that off, get that video game that we've seen in NASCAR as Viriel <laughs> coming across the checkered flag in first place. Man, what a great battle there on the last couple of laps. Just absolutely insane. What started off as a slow heat number one, Dantas leading most of the way. But at the last moment, the last couple of laps, Viriel able to really reel him in and overtake to get first place in heat number one. So we can see there, Diego Viriel, your winner, followed by Evandro Dantas in second place. Looks like he was only about a second, 1.1 seconds, as we can see. Ben Q session, Viriel looking in the zone. I've never seen more focus on this man as he was able to pull the upset. Of course, Dantas, your number one qualifier and still able to get the fastest lap. So we know Dantas is very quick, but again, out here, this isn't a sprint race as much as it is an endurance race. Even though we're still only going 41 laps here, 41 miles, it's all about strategy, all about keeping that consistency. So now, what do you think we can expect from Heat 2, Somil? A lot more of the same, but I would be very, very interested to see what Evandro Dantas does now. Because quite clearly, he now has realized where he lost Heat number one, which is tire management. He pushed quite a lot. In fact, almost had a gap of four seconds at one point in this race. But what's the point if you're not leading the final lap of the race, which Villarreal did convincingly? For him right now, he'll be trying to wrong, right those wrongs basically, by managing his tires a lot better and being a lot smoother at the throttle. And that is going to be fun to watch all the way through. Of course, as we go green, green flag out as Dantas looking to pull away early on again. So Dantas right now was leading. So this is already a repeat of what we've seen from heat number one. Dantas being able to pull away quick right out of the gate. But again, like we mentioned, as we've seen from the last one, it is all about consistency. So although Vial Riel, he may be slightly slower, we know that he is able to keep it out of the wall and able to keep those tires fresh. So. I really believe right here, this is going to come down to who is just going to be able to keep it a little bit safe. So it's that fine balance. How much do I push versus how safe do I play it? And from heat number one, we can see that paid off for Viriel. So right now, Dantas already about a second and a half faster from that last lap and looking like Viriel has been very consistent on sector one. Again, out here at Phoenix Raceway, Turns one and two are a little bit more asymmetrical compared to turns two and three. So, I mean, sorry, three and four. So it's not just a split down the half like we see at a lot of these super speedways. We do have a little bit of a different configuration. And I love seeing that. I love seeing raceways here and also another very popular one for being a very asymmetrical raceway, uh, such as Pocono, which that one is, you know, <clears throat> having that extra yeah. wide bend. So not a typical trialable out here and you can definitely tell Viriel is absolutely making it known that he is very comfortable on to on this layout absolutely and this circuit what's more interesting about this place is also that while it's asymmetrical there's a bit of a change in the banking as well here there at this particular circuit turn one and two 11 degrees nine degrees at three and four slight changes here and there and being this old circuit being the circuit with the rougher tarmac you can't afford to make sure that he use every inch of that banking because if you go higher up like dantas is consistently doing you will eventually chew your tires up and end up losing the race but i like this uh, even though it's a two car race even though it's quite a long one for only two cars i don't think it's boring quite frankly because what we saw at the end of the last race is what every good motor race needs.
two competitors on alternative strategies, be it one car faster in a certain part of the circuit or the other one faster in a certain part of the circuit or even a different time of the race as well, which is what we saw last time. And then both of them converging to create a really good photo finish right at the very end. Now, it wasn't quite the closest finish in the world, admittedly, but it got very close towards the very end and time was running out for Villarreal to make his move. This is what makes it such a fun race. Sure, it might only be a two-car race, but the strategy involved and the micro games they'll have to play with each other over the course of what is going to be quite an extended qualifying session. And watch how gentle the steering inputs on Villarreal's car is. You can see the camera on the left there, just the way he has to manage it so lightly. He's lucky to be using one of those steering wheels because back in the day, I can imagine, Kevin, you must need some proper biceps to wrestle a car around this place while also managing tyres. That's not a task I would love to do, honestly. Yeah, of course, being able to wrestle these old vehicles around this track is a task in itself, on top of being as fast as you possibly can. But one thing I was noticing over the last couple of laps, you can see right here that typically the best rule of thumb in NASCAR is, hey, usually you want to get down as close as you can down to that yellow line on turns one and two. But right here, as we can see on this track, with the banking be a, being a little bit different, not being quite as steep all the way through, you can see that there's been a lot of rubber laid down, about a car and a half, two car widths from the bottom. So right there, these drivers have figured out that, all right, going all the way down to the bottom isn't quite the fastest way around this track in these vehicles. So they're able to leave it just a little bit higher. And that seems to be the line around here today, as well as so far looking like Dantas has still had the fastest lap. So these guys, we were seeing earlier, close to 30 second laps out here. So <laughs> right now running a little bit slower. And of course, always during qualifying, you're not worried about the tire wire. You're not worried about that. You're just worried about getting the fastest lap down. Whereas now we can see Dantas leading by roughly three and a half seconds over Villarreal. Again, everyone can see Facundo Rago on the timing screen. He was here earlier on. We're still not sure if he was having technical issues or if he just decided, hey, Connor Healy isn't out here today. I really don't have to race if I don't want to, to still be in contention for the championship. So again, uh, with the points. So we've been out here and it's a 12 week, week long season this year or this season for season four of AMX one NASCAR. We've been out here for 10 weeks prior to this whoa as we see Dantas just sliding a little bit he's pushing it now so we know his tires are getting a little bit heated but like I was saying back to the championship overall championship of AMX1 NASCAR right now Facundo Rago only has to really be leading by over 23 points going into next week so he only has to be 23 points over Connor Healy and just have a clean race and he will be your champion so knowing that Connor Healy was unable to be here today I'd say that, you know, there is a very good possibility whoa. that, whoa, <laughs> as Dantas is getting really squirrely now, so we might have a repeat of less heat. So, but like I said, so is it strategy or are there technical issues for Facundo Rago? Either way, the outcome will still be the same. He will still be leading the championship even after this race, as he is so far ahead of these other couple drivers in points that he doesn't really have to worry too much. But back to today's race, Dantas getting a little bit squirrely so we'll have to see if Villarreal can do what he did in heat number one and really reel that back in the way things are going I think we're very much on track for a repeat because at this point of the last race we also saw a similar gap emerging around three seconds 3.2 3.5 something thereabouts but in the last race we didn't see Dantas work his tires half as much as we've seen him work this race because he's been sliding around far more and reaching closer to the top end of the barriers than he did in the last race. I mean, we almost saw him correct a power slide midway through. And this might seem a little bit random out of context that both of us are just talking about a driver correcting a slide in what is a two-person race. But look at the broader picture. The more he does this, the more he wears his tires out, the more heat he puts into them, by the very end, they're literally going to be like scrambled eggs. There's going to be no tarmac left in them, uh, no grip left in them, my, my apologies. Which means that Villarreal could have it even easier 
to pass Dantas at the very end. Now, last time, place was a bit of an issue because we didn't quite have a very open line. But even this time out, the bottom line can work out well. We're already seeing, as you rightly mentioned, more grip on the middle line as well. So it's only going to get easier for Villarreal if this continues. Dantas is fast, quite clearly faster than Villarreal at the moment. But can he keep it up over what is going to be quite a long 40 lap race? Yeah, and like we seen last year, of course, looks like history may very well repeat itself. Villarreal, although still about a three second gap, but like we said last year, he had about a four second gap between Dantas and Villarreal. So. Even though it's been about a consistent three second, we can see Viriel down there on the bottom. He's still been consistently faster through that sector one. And then unfortunately losing a little bit of speed through sector two. So right there going out through that, uh, through the dog leg, which is how it's known um, coming out of, I always get this one. I know we're back at the old legacy. So on the new way that the track is configured, <laughs> We have the start finish line, of course, going at the beginning of that dog leg. So turns one and two are kind of flipped on their head. What was one and two is now three and four. What was three and four is now one and two. It's a little bit confusing, especially because this track is still ran on iRacing uh, for a lot of races because just how popular this track really was. You know, it's such a unique track, even before the repave, after the repave. And um, another big thing, too, is uh, 2011. That was when they had the major changes out here at Phoenix Raceway. And then again, they had another repave back in 2019. But 2011 was the big one whenever it went from this configuration a little bit more similar to how we see it today. And unfortunately, what used to have a lot of road races, that then started to slow down a little bit. But this track, not only is it run on NASCAR, it is run for IndyCar as well. So, you know, for that, we have... Yeah. Uh, fan favorite IndyCar driver of Tony Kanaan holding the fastest lap here. Of course, like you can't compare directly IndyCar to NASCAR, but a lot of the races are still racing on the same tracks as far as the ovals go. Um, so <clears throat> that too, I'd love to see. I know there's some people too that would love it as well. Uh, IndyCar showing up here and there. I know here at NASCAR last season, we had uh, NASCAR from some of these drivers that have been using the AMX that have been participating in the AMX 10 races also had a few NASCAR tracks to do last season. But this season, we decided, hey, you know what? We're going to make it its own category, its own competition. And so far, it's been some great times of having NASCAR every single Saturday this season. As we can see now, Viriel still hovering about three seconds behind, but again, slowly reeling that in. So. We are roughly halfway through out here at Phoenix Raceway. 20 laps out of 41 laps here in heat number two. And there is more management for Dantas right now. He only has a 3.2 second gap, similar to what he had last time out. But remember, 10 laps from now, around lap 30, is when it all started to crumble for him. And that is when Villarreal really came back into the race, eventually using his tyre wear. Now, I know we mentioned this earlier, but concentration has to come into the play right now. As we see Villarreal really get close to the barriers at this one occasion as well. But concentration, it's been a long and demanding one. They've already had a 20-minute qualifying session before this, then a 20-minute race. And on top of that, they're 10-odd minutes into another race. That much consistent driving with only two people on track gets to the best of the very best. I mean, even if you put Jeff Gordon on the track right now, he might end up making a few minor mistakes here and there. It's only human because you have barely any reference marker, barely anything else to keep your mind active and hungry. So you do tend to slip out and do tend to make those minor errors. It is a game of chess. It is a game of strategy. It is a game of concentration and it is a game of survival more than anything else and look like clockwork when we come to lap 23 that gap is now getting underneath that three second mark consistently are we going to see Villarreal go one up on Dantas yet again this time and only make it even better than last time get get that pass done perhaps 35 laps into the race instead of lap 38 And we will just have to see again like you mentioned now consistently under three seconds which will soon be possibly consistently two and a half seconds 
So right now about 2.6 seconds behind Dantes as we have Viriel reeling him in. You can see now Sector 1 and Sector 2. Viriel is about a tenth quicker. So with just less than 20 laps to go out here at Phoenix, if as long as these drivers don't have any errors or any mistakes, it looks like Viriel may very well be catching up. And we have that repeat of the first heat. So again, no pressure, but Viriel... Will he be able to reel it in? I think he just might, as he's now hovering just under and just around two and a half seconds back. But as a driver on these courses, you know, that is the biggest thing of, I have only led a few laps out here in these AMX1 NASCAR races. Um, unfortunately, not doing the best during qualifying, but with that reversed grid, being able to be towards the front of the pack and have a couple laps of fresh air. So not very long, but just being in other iRacing series as well, I can tell you that once you are in that front place, if you do not already have that rhythm in, which you know, hey, I can get these 41 laps in here and I can keep the time consistent without slowing down too much by the end of the race. I mean, having that amount of rhythm is probably one of the hardest things to do in any of these cars. I mean, really just in any race, once you find that rhythm, once you find that smoothness, especially out here you're cooking those tires being smooth is everything out here on these nascar ovals so as we head into lap 27 now viriel just over two seconds behind dantes he's closing in slowly and steadily gaining a lot of time at the turn one and turn two section that is where you've got to be really technical with your turn ins because that is where the, the corner becomes pretty tight in turn three turn four you can carry a lot more momentum by getting a good run off the dog leg but not one and two which we are going to be seeing right now and watch the way the car reacts to the exit of this corner watch how much it can potentially slide off and end up losing time there that is where Villarreal has consistently been the faster driver indicating and he's been managing his tires far, far better. But again, same question. Can he make it till the very end? And can he have enough time to pass? Because in a way, yes, he had almost the perfect race last time out by getting the win pretty late on. But it might be a bit too late for most people's liking. If I was Villarreal, I'd probably like to finish it off earlier and make the win more secure. That's just me talking. Maybe he likes to leave it late. But that is a big question in his mind. Maybe... Dantas has learned what he has to do to defend from Villarreal when he comes calling, perhaps shutting down the right lines. So it's not a dead contest yet. There are still 10 or more laps left to go. And this battle, sure, it might seem plain sailing right now, but when it kick starts, oh, trust me, when we get ignition, this will be super exciting to the very end. Yes, and here we go into lap number 30 of 41. Dantis now leading by just over a second. So what we seen earlier on, Dantis was pushing it hard, but unfortunately pushing it hard early on did not pay off for him and he won. And it looks like right now is giving that opportunity for Villarreal to come make a move here very soon. So being fastest and most aggressive can pay off in some scenarios. Unfortunately, the layout of this track it is not quite paying off right now, but like we said, it isn't over until it's over, so we're not going to count Dantas out. Although Virial has been able to save tires, Dantas still was doing a great job. We've seen last heat, Virial had made a move earlier on, roughly about the same time as we are here now, but Dantas was able to get it right back. So again, right now, a battle of the minds, a battle of concentration, and especially, we know Dantas not being... <clears throat> One of the regulars that he wants to absolutely leave his stamp here on amx1 nascar he wants to say hey guys i am here i want you to know who i am i want you to know that hey i'm gonna be here as much as i can to put the pressure on these drivers as Villarreal looking to get the inside line right now so right now we have the battle on lap 32 as Villarreal goes back to the outside looking to come back in so these drivers are now about to battle it out for the win. So we will see what the strategy is from Viriel. Does he try to go for that early cut underneath? Or is he going to wait till the last couple laps like he did in heat number one? We will have to wait and see. 
and I'm so glad we get to see the drivers in action. Watch their eyes, watch how locked in and how focused they are. On the left, we have Villarreal chasing, trying to get P1 up ahead of his main rival, Evandro Dantas, who's on the opponent camp that you can see right now. Interesting to see that Dantas also moves his head while turning as well. It's a commonly known strategy. You, of course, go faster by doing that. But no, back to the more, more serious stuff. It's the precision, it's what Villarreal is doing with those steering movements that's really working out well for him. But then again, time is of the essence. Only six or more laps left to go. He chooses to go on the outside line. That is a brave, brave place to put your car around the outside of someone at this circuit where the outside line probably isn't the best place in the world to go to. But nevertheless, it was an attempt, an attempt that just didn't work out for Villarreal. Touch wood for him, he has more time. But not do much, Kevin. Absolutely, is Villarreal now dropping back, which he had made a move earlier, but it just wasn't quite enough. Now he is about 0.3 seconds behind Dantas, but he's getting a great run. So as you can see, during Heat 1 and Heat 2, Villarreal has been very, very consistent right there through Sector 1s. So uh, going through turns 1 and 2 right there, he was extremely consistent. About a tenth faster every single time going through there as we are now going into lap number 36. So Dantas leading half a second. Villarreal looking again. It is that balance of do I push it and hope, you know, hope I don't make a mistake. As we could see getting very close to that wall, which of course is what you want to do when you're coming in through some of these lines. You want to get as close as you can to the outside wall. Make a move on the inside. Of course, you can see again here these drivers not going all the way down quite to the yellow line until they're hitting more towards of a late apex on here. So again, that seems to have been a little bit faster as Villarreal now on the rear bumper and it looks oh. like he will be into the back of Dantes as Dantes goes spinning almost into the wall, but so does Villarreal. So right there, that could have been a very bad wreck for the both of them. Unfortunately, Villarreal getting the bad end of the deal there as Dantes is able to start walking away with this. So that may just be it, folks. Dantas now eight seconds ahead of Virial after that contact with 37 laps in out of 41. Oh, well, that is such a sad way to see the end of what was turning into such a technical battle. Villarreal clobbering into the back of Dantas. And luckily for us, we at least don't have to sort this race out by going to the stewards, which is a great thing. But it's so unfortunate. He had one chance to make that move work properly, and he got a bit too much momentum hitting the back of Valeria, uh, hitting the back of Dantas. My apologies. And there it went eventually. And so, even though you might be the faster one, even though you might end up burning out your tires a lot, it's probably not the worst option in the world because passing at a place like Phoenix as it has proven to be time and again, is such a challenging task. One that Villarreal couldn't quite execute properly, and now he's back in the pit lane. Sure, Dantas must have chewed up his tyres. This is a win well earned, I'd say, Kevin. So, of course, now Dantas being able to walk away with it. He may have a little bit of tyres, a little bit of flat spots on those tyres, but Villarreal back into the pit lane. So, an unfortunate and crazy end to heat number two for Villarreal. But I know Dantes is finally feeling that relief of not having to look back in his mirrors. He just knows, hey man, I have, have roughly one more lap to go. I just need to finish and I'm walking away out of here for your heat two winner. So again, Dantes, Villarreal, and looks like Rago may be getting a DNF out of this. So we did get confirmation earlier on that Rago does indeed have enough points that he is your current NASCAR champion. So we will have to get with him later on as Dantas comes across for the white flag. One more lap to go out here at Phoenix Raceway. So Dantas getting second place. And this is the thing that we love to see. So all of you viewers out there watching, you can come out here and get involved with this. Get some of that prize money. If you would have came out today, just finishing the race would have got you pretty much a podium position out here today as Dantas slowing it down you can see the absolute relief from this driver saying man I got out of that incident early on and on to win heat number two so one win for Villarreal one win for Dantas congratulations to both drivers but Dantas 
was doing slightly better in qualifying. So, again, it looks like he will be today's big winner of the day. And of course, as we can see there, your BenQ session winner for today, we have Ivandro Dantas. So the Brazilian able to hold on to it there, those last few laps of heat number two and come away your BenQ session winner as well as setting the fastest lap. So Ivandro Dantas first place, Diego Viriel in second. And unfortunately, Facundo Rago was not able to make it onto the racetrack out here today. But a big congratulations to both of our drivers, Dantas setting the fastest in qualifying, so he will slightly edge out Villarreal in today's overall win. But, uh, like we said earlier, hey, just because there's not a full grid doesn't mean we're going to have some boring races. You know, there's always action to be had, no matter what, out here at AMX. As we've seen all season long of season four, as we close out our AMX one NASCAR, Remember, we do have next week, which should be interesting because every time that we've been at Daytona so far, it looks like we've had quite an interesting grid, quite an interesting matchup. So today, congratulations to Dantas, congratulations to Villarreal, and also confirming since, unfortunately, Connor Hilly was out today, that means Facundo Rago is your AMX Season 4 NASCAR champion. So a huge congratulations to Facundo Rago. I hope that you are here next week to just be able to lead away in the points. Of course, we want all of our drivers final week out here battling it out. But again, it should make an interesting one more week of AMX 1 NASCAR. But Somil, what are your final thoughts on today's NASCAR race? I loved it. Honestly, I did. Initially, when I saw the grid size, I was confused slightly. I was wondering, why would nobody want to race this car at this track? I mean, on paper, it sounds so much fun. But when we saw the race, I think we got the answer for why. It is challenging. It is tough when it gets down to the proper depths of time management. And only two drivers opted for that challenge. And dare I say, both of them aced it in their respective ways. Different strategies from both of them. We saw Dantas going for more of an all-out approach of racing. And we saw Villarreal going for something more of a time management approach. One that could have worked out had he pulled off the right move on that last, on the third last lap of the race eventually. But it's good to see variability. It's good to see that both strategies eventually won out on their own merit. And I like that we had two weeks so that we could tell both of these things apart properly. But all in all, even though it was two people, it was great racing all the way through. And I like the fact that both the drivers gave it their best in their respective ways to get me one. And touch wood, both of them won today. So, of course, as always, we had a bit of a smaller grid today, but that was still some big action there at the end of heat number one and heat number two. Of course, we are getting ready to go into our AMX 10 race here very soon. So all of you at home, make sure you stick around for that as we go back across outside the US going over to Europe. We will have Spa in our GT4 cars coming up here very soon. Make sure to also follow our socials on the screen as well. But that will wrap it up here for our AMX1 NASCAR race. Come back next week for the final championship race. Of course, Facundo Rago, your current champ. But anything can happen at Daytona. Daytona always makes for some of the best racing. That is why it is one of the most popular tracks in the world. But we will see you soon, very soon. Thank you for watching us. AMX1 NASCAR signing out.
to save our home. We must travel through the gateway to find new energy.
Overlooking the beautiful forest of Stavlo, Belgium, we are back with more of Season 4 AMX 10 Racing out at Spa with the GT4 cars today. And as always, I'm Kevin Garcia, and today, joining me, we have a very special guest as well. So again, joining me today, I am Kevin Garcia, and we have Somil today alongside in the booth. Somil, how are you doing today after an amazing AMX1 race and now hopping into AMX1 or into AMX10? What can we expect to see today? Fun, fun, fun. So much fun. I think that's the only thing on all of our minds. We're getting to see so many cars race each other at Spa Franco Shop. And yes, we are racing GT4s today which means that there's going to be tons of back racing. And to top it all off, we're not just racing one car in GT4s. So like in the past, you might imagine GT4 fields being only Porsches, right? Well, hello, you've got it wrong here because we've got Porsches, Mercedes. I think one Aston Martin's in the mix as well. Am I seeing a BMW and a couple of McLarens on that entry list as well? I think I am, yes. So it's going to be a very diverse grid of sports cars at a circuit that is a pantheon of sports car racing. So many legends have been crowned here and it's a circuit that properly tests you as a driver. And when you mix it up and when you consider the quality of the grid of it, I think only one word comes to mind. It's a word that I mentioned earlier. Fun. There's going to be so much of it on offer today. Absolutely. One of the most popular tracks, some of the most popular cars out there, makes and models. But of course, for all of you watching on the stream, make sure to follow us on all of our socials. They are currently on the screen. So we post highlights, we post crashes, we post wins. All of the action can be followed up there as well as on our live stream. But before we get into today's race, we have a few things to go over. So like we mentioned earlier, we are in season four of AMX Global Racing. And we started this season back in January 27th. I can't believe we are already almost towards the end. We will be here through April 21st. So next weekend already. Can't believe it. This season has flown by. This season we had a prize pool of $20,000 and next level racing gear. So it's been absolutely great so far. We hope to have a great couple of weeks left. The race format is as follows. We have a 20 minute qualifying session followed by a top 15 reverse grid. Going into heat number one, it is a 20 minute race followed by another top 15 reverse grid into heat number two of, of course, 20 minutes. So we have the two heats as well as our qualifying here in AMX 10 racing this season. For all of our drivers, our driver cams are required. You can get more information on that on our AMX Discord or on the website. Payouts will be balances over $100 every single month. So once you hit that $100 threshold, you can expect to see that money hit your account. Race days are Tuesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And of course, anyone is free to join if they go over to amxrace.com we have all of our rules and regulations there so if you want to come in here win some prize money head over to amxrace.com get yourself signed up like i mentioned we do race on tuesdays saturdays and sundays amx1 races start at 5 50 p.m followed shortly by amx10 at 7 20 p.m and all of these times are in gmt so make sure to see what time zone you're in and calculate it we love to have you in these races Going back into our AMX 10 race prize pool. We mentioned a little bit earlier, but this is a breakdown starting with our qualifying. First place gets $30, second place gets $20, third gets 18, and so on and so forth, all the way down into 15th place. Then once we go to that top 15 reverse grid, our heats number one and heat two have the exact same following, $30 for first, $20 for second, $18 for third and it goes down the list into 15th place and also for heat number one and heat number two if you're able to set the fastest lap you'll get an additional four dollars totaling 
to our prize pool of $500 each race. And keep in mind, for the AMX 10 races, you must have a minimum road eye rating of 2,000 to join in here. So we like to have as many people in here, but of course for AMX 10, like we mentioned, 2,000 and above, feel free to come in here and win a part of that prize pool. So here is your current AMX 10 top 12. Starting in that first place position with 1,300 points, we have Gaio Valero. So he is quite a bit ahead of everyone else. Second place, we have Kieran Harrison. Third, Aaron Vasquez. Fourth place, Gaston Kulavi. Fifth place, Dino Filippa. In sixth, Jackson SNJ. Seventh place, Pedro Dean. Eighth, Fabio Zamperlini. Ninth place, Simone Demori. In tenth, Juan Blaynot. Eleventh place, Peter Zuba. And rounding it out in 12th place, we have Quarantine Guinez. So, of course, that is your AMX 10 top 12 through all of our AMX 10 races. But what here we are here today for our rear wheel drive class and starting down in 10th place, your AMX top 10 for our rear wheel drive starts with Pedro Dean in 10th place with 215 points. 9th place, Kieran Harrison with 222 points. 8th place, Dino Filippo with 225 points. 7th place, Simone de Mori with 247 points and dropping down a couple positions. And 6th place, holding 6th place from last week as well, Fabio Zamperlini with 251 points. 5th place, Gaston Kulavi with 265 points. Going up 3 places, we have Jackson Asenje sitting in that 4th place spot with 267 points. And your top 3 in 3rd place, Juan Blaynot with 350 points. Second place, Gael Valero with 402 points. And of course, your current AMX 10 rear wheel drive class leader, Aaron Vasquez with 564 points. So he is currently a <coughs> leading by quite a bit of a margin and with only a couple weeks left in the race, a couple weeks left for AMX 10 rear wheel drive class, he may be very close to our current championship so of course we will have to see how today plays out for Aaron Vasquez but he is so far leading with quite a good margin so now we will get into our track info our car info see what we're doing today we're at spa but I'll head that back over to Samil Samil take it away what can be said about spa francochamps apart from the fact that it is an absolute temple of sports car racing We've had so many epic endurance races here from literally the day this circuit was built back a century ago. And I'm talking about when this place used to be along the circuit, going around the villages of Belgium and not just a seven kilometer layout that we know today. Sports car racing is in the blood of Spa Francorchamps. Dare I say, Spa Francorchamps is in the blood of sports car racing as well. And if you are racing GT4s like we are today, each and every single one of those tight and twisty curves that you will see here today would challenge the best of the very best. Imagine Eau Rouge in a GT4 car. Can you take it flat out? Do you have the guts to take it flat out? Can you race side by side there? Can you manage turns like Bloshimo towards the very end or execute a perfect run back down at the bus stop chicane where overtaking maneuvers are a limitless possibility? That's the challenge that this circuit offers. Only 8 laps today in the races, which is normally a little less when you compare it to any other road course, but it is Spa, so 8 laps will feel like a proper test of concentration for these drivers. But look at the grid, look at the quality of the drivers that we have. Alejandro Sanchez from Apex Racing Team, Roman Pascucci, we have Kyle Valero from Apex Racing, also racing, among many others as well. It's a top-class grid, and once these drivers are out to fight against each other, you know for a fact that the margin for errors are even lower than they would ever be. This one will be fun, and if it's a sports car race, Spa has to be the home of it. And the cars, well, 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 we have quite a few GT4s. We have, of course, in its majority, Porsches. There are quite a few of them. We have a few McLarens there as well. We also have the, uh, the McLaren 570S, yes, that is. We then also have the Aston Martin Vantage along with a couple of BMW M4 GT4s. And the best part about GT4 is diversity. 
Some of these cars are incredible on the corners, a la the Porsche, a la the McLaren. But the other ones, like the BMW, like the Aston Martin, the straights are really where you will see a ton of their grunt coming in handy. Now, the GT4s are not as loved as their elder siblings, the GT3s, but once you get into it, it's a lot like salted chips. You take one bite and you just can't stop and that's what GT4 racing is like. Once you dip your foot into it, you just can't get out, especially when you consider how good the competition in this class is and continues to be because of one simple thing. Limited aerodynamics, that's the best part about GT4. So you don't have to worry that much about dirty air and drag and all that other scientific stuff that makes your racing dull. Sure, this might not be as fast, but in terms of fun, this certainly tops the list of all sports cars. Man, I could not have asked for a better introduction on our cars and track than we had today. But now we're about to head into qualifying. That way we can get a look at what is going on with our drivers currently. So, like it was mentioned earlier today, we do have quite a decent sized grid. So we have over 20 cars. So every time we get cars over 20 on a grid, you know that is going to be some very interesting racing, especially as such an iconic track as we have today. So right now we are a little bit more than halfway through our qualifying session. So we're about 12 minutes in to our 20 minute qualifying. And as it currently sits, we do have the two Spaniards of Alejandro Sanchez and Aaron Vasquez taking the lead. So right now a one, two for Spain. As we are on board, we're gonna have to see here as it comes up folks, uh, who is in the, looks like the number six car. So that is Aaron Vasquez sporting the number six Porsche today. So once again, Aaron Vasquez has been our current points leader for the rear wheel drive class. So we will have to see how he does today. He does have the potential to walk away a champion out of here today. But we will have to, like I said, we are very early on. Aaron Vasquez sitting in that second place position. Will he be able to improve on his time and get pole position, pole position once again? That has been the theme all season long. And if he does that, it'll be a fun race to watch to see all the others trying to catch up to him. Now, watching the gaps in qualifying is turning out to be a really fun task because the margin between the top five drivers is only half a second. That, uh, that is only five tenths. Now, it does get chaotic in GD4s, for sure it does, sometimes even in qualifying as we have seen in La Source. But the important thing is, watching how close they are to each other in terms of raw pace. At the very top, Alejandro Sanchez only has a one point, actually, now he's better his lap. He only has a four tenth of a second advantage over Aaron Vasquez, who has been by far and away one of the star drivers of this championship. But it will come down because with GT4s, the more momentum you build into your tires, the more you get them warmed up and the more you are in the sync of this circuit, the faster your lap times become. So don't be surprised if some people actually go and clock their best lap right at the very end of that qualifying. These GT4 tires come into their prime the more you drive them. And we can see too that we have a lot of people recognizing our drivers out here today. So again, we have uh, if you don't notice, uh, for those of you that may be new to iRacing, we can see their iRating on the right side. Tons of amazing drivers that have put in countless hours. You can see there, of course, the likes of Aaron Vasquez, over 11K iRating, and Sanchez above him with that black card right there, meaning he has that 9.6K iRating, but having that black license right there means that he is in official pro series. So. We have several drivers that have been in some of the iRacing Pro Series as well. As well as right here, Aaron Vasquez, he is only 16 years old, so do not let the age fool you. We have drivers in here from 16 years old. We have drivers in here over 50 years old. We have drivers of all ages, all skills, all coming out here every single week to battle it out. And I can tell you these battles have been legendary as it looks like Aaron Vasquez coming to a stop there didn't quite have the lap that he's looking so he'll reset and try to get in here looks like he may only have one chance though to improve to try and get that top spot but as we go back here we can see the brazilians of victor miranda and jackson Asenje. so down in the middle of the pack currently we have a lot of people now i'm trying to keep up with the scorecards looks like uh like you mentioned samil earlier 
these drivers setting in their fastest laps here towards the very end. Yup, and that will be a battle to watch for. Now, particularly what I'm waiting to see is what do the drivers with the lower I rating actually sound like or actually feel like in this particular qualifying session? Because there are a few to watch for. Martin Chico, well, he is only P8 right now, but he is an interesting driver to watch for. He has been quite good. And in all of the other AMX 10 races and AMX 1 races that we've had so far, He's been a common occurrence, a driver who never backs down and will keep fighting until the very, very end. So his I rating only might be 3.8 uh, compared to all the others. He's going to be interested in how much he fights and he's got that classic Argentinian fighting spirit within him anyway. But speaking of the regulars, speaking of the really good drivers in this championship, drivers who have actually impressed all of us with their class so far, we have to look at the likes of Gael Valero, Alejandro Sanchez and Aaron Vasquez. I mean, Aaron Vasquez, by far and away, has been the class of the field. But watch for Gael as well, racing for Apex Racing. And if all of you are new to the sim racing game, Apex Racing are really one of the top teams out there. Gael is one of their most top drivers. And he's consistently been a strong performer in some of our other races as well. Be it rear wheel drive TCR cars, actually not rear wheel drive TCR, be it TCR cars or GTEs or whatever it might be. So put Valero in a rear wheel drive car or even a front wheel drive car as we've seen previously and he will do well. And we are seeing that happen right now as well as he's P5 in qualifying. Something tells me that he will get faster though. Let's wait and see. By the way, have I just seen an NFS most wanted paint scheme on David Juyok's car? The number 11 with the number one, uh, the, car, the driver in P11 with car number one. That is phenomenal. That that has to be put in the iRacing livery hall of fame because I've never seen an M4 GD4 ever painted quite like that. And that is one that belongs to the streets. That is brilliant. That is beautiful. <laughs> oh man, I, I love to see that too. Especially that just takes me back to my childhood playing Need for Speed Most Wanted. Seeing that livery out here today, uh, but like you you were mentioning earlier, uh, a lot of different racing teams out here today. I know you mentioned uh, Apex Racing, which uh, they've been uh, really on top of it all season long of those guys, as well as uh, Drago Racing as well. So you know we have them, and of course Team Redline coming in here. We have some guys that were on the uh, race team for Tony Kanan. So there's a lot of absolutely amazing top tier drivers that we're lucky enough to be able to see here every single week so i mean i know a lot of people they tune in to all of the iRacing special events and of course you always see a lot of the teams there but uh yeah i may be a little biased here but i th feel like you know some of these amx races are just as good if not better recruiting some of the top talent some of the best of the best on the platform showing up here week in and week out as we can see Pascucci almost getting into a little bit of an incident there with uh, Chico <laughs> that could have uh, turned out a little bit bad you know they'd have to have words but looks like we are uh, we're going into the final minute of our qualifying so this may very well be how it fails out for our heat number one but again sanchez still just a little bit over vasquez and everyone looks like they are pitting so we'll see chico i'm not sure if he'll have enough time to set in one more lap and improve he currently sits in that fourth place position but again with as many drivers as we have out here today it is such a concentrated field of talent such amazing drivers and i know i've gotten <laughs> invited of hey you know, one of these days of, uh, of course, being a commentator of, hey, when I'm not commentating, you have to hop in some of these races. But uh, I feel like, man, just the amount of talent that is out here on the field, I would be getting in their way a little bit. <laughs> I swear, these drivers are on another level. But even then, it does leave out the door for a few others to just barge in and make their mark. Like Martin Chico, like Roman Pascucci, our AMX regulars, who might not have as fancy a racing license as all, as all the others, but they have qualified P4 and P5 respectively, which is quite something when you consider how stacked that grid is. Absolutely, you can see right there on screen your Ben Q session winner setting the fastest qualifying lap, Alejandro Sanchez with a two minute 27.032. So these guys absolutely quick out here. Second place, we have Aaron Vasquez, who is your current points leader for rear wheel drive. Juan Blaynot in third. Fourth place goes Martin, Mar Martin Chico. 
Fifth place, Roman Pascucci. Sixth place, Dino Filippa. Seventh place, Gael Valero. Eighth, Victor Miranda. Ninth place, Bruno Du Carmo. Tenth place, Jackson SNJ. Eleventh, Florian Lebigre. Twelfth place, David Givak. Thirteenth, Tobias Soriano. Fourteenth place, Nikodem Virzbiski. Fifteenth, Gaston Kulavi. Sixteenth, Maxi Aruz. Seventeenth, Pedro Dean. And rounding it out right here, we have eighteenth, Ero Encina. So again, we have over 20 drivers here but again only cash prizes going out to those top 15 as we can see scrolling down now pass into 19th fabio zamperlini 20th we have our very own broadcaster connor nixon 21st joss perwin 22nd place fabio do carmo 23rd tim state and it looks like unfortunately down sitting at the very end daniel moreno was unable to put down a lap time but there you see 24 drivers on today's grid it's going to be absolutely insane especially once we get through lap number one that is always lap number one with 24 drivers plus a reverse grid coming off of qualifying we know there's going to be some chaos guaranteed you know we always say all right the commentators curse as soon as we say how clean things are going things start getting a little bit chaotic but i'm gonna say it right now lap number one i have a feeling it's gonna be just absolutely chaotic off the bat spa one of these absolutely great pairing with the gt4 cars like i said they might not be as quick as the gt3 they might not be as quick as some of the formula cars but slowing it down a little always means very close racing and turn one la source is going to be a critical point looking at the eye rating of these drivers you would expect that they would keep it very very clean don't forget it is GT4 cars. They don't have as much downforce. Drivers will go crazy in trying to make a move at turn number one and beyond as well. Watch out for La Source. Watch out for Lecom and the chicane at the top of the hill. These are going to be two major points of action. But now, it's time to get the racing going at last. And here we go. Going into heat one of our AMX 10 race, the GT4 cars. We have Gaston Kulavi, who is able to hold on so far, but again, it's too early to tell as we have Yuzbiski and Soriano. Soriano Lebigre able to make it up a place already. So right here, battles towards the middle of the pack as people going up a couple spots, people going down. And so far, so good after this. But now we go out down the hill and up the other side of the hill into Eau Rouge, one of the most famous parts of the track. You can just see, although these GT4 cars, these guys are still and they are still so quick through this section. Was that Jackson Vicente and Victor Miranda fighting each other side by side, heading up on Rouge? If that was, that was absolutely mind-boggling about firstly how they kept it clean and secondly how they were able to just make sure that it didn't lose time to anyone behind them. Meanwhile, there are a couple of Aston Martins fighting side by side against each other. This is what cheating is all about. And now we are seeing a train coming behind them. That would be Bruno de Carmo and Victor Miranda. Miranda gets sent to the outside line where there is absolutely no grip. And guess what? Gael Valero sent one on his outside. Unfortunately for him, he can't quite get the move in that black Porsche. But wow, we this is what clean lap one racing is all about. And this doesn't end right here, Kevin. We're seeing more battles at the top three leaders, and that should call for a really spicy race all the way through. Of course, one of the things that we always see in these AMX 10 races is even though we may have battles up front, we always have some of the best battles happening on during the middle of the pack. And we can see the three Brazilian drivers all sporting the same livery right there in the middle of the pack. Senje, Miranda, Carmo, right in front of Gael Valero, who again, Gael Valero has been very consistent all season long and one of the top drivers. But now we're going back to the front of the pack where Kulavi is still trying to defend off Pierce Bisky, but both of them better keep an eye on Soriano shortly behind them. As we go back right now in 13th place, we have Chico followed by Aaron Vasquez. So Aaron Vasquez is trying to claw his way through this field. But like we said, it's such a stacked field today that that's going to make it very hard for Aaron Vasquez Ooh. to get back to the front where he wants to be. But man, these guys bumper to bumper, the Porsche is almost running into each other. We've seen a little bit of getting uh, very close to the back of Veers Bisky right there in that BMW as well. So 
man, these guys just going absolutely crazy. And especially on this track, there's so much on this track that's very well rounded for all these cars. So there's not really one car that's going to be better than the others. It's very balanced field. Some a little bit better on the straight, some a little bit better through the corner, but overall a very balanced race today. Absolutely, which is what is going to make Aaron Vasquez's race so interesting now that he finds himself back down in P14 in a Porsche, probably the most balanced car. One that doesn't quite have a particular advantage over the other ones, but we'll get to that shortly. As we are seeing the pass for the lead, it's Ray Pitsky going to the outside line in Polari. This is going to be a phenomenal move if he can pull this off from the outside of Lecom. And Nico de Wilkinski from Bravo Racing has sent it and has made it work in that BMW M4. Using every single bit of that Bavarian horsepower to climb up into P1, but the battles are not quite done yet, Kevin. It seems like Soriano is also taking advantage of Pulavi's bad run and he's not slipped that torture up into P2. Like we've seen there, that's the beauty of having these reverse grids is that, hey, maybe you didn't get that good of a qualifying round, but now you can see from Soriano and Kulavi, they weren't the fastest to qualify, but they're saying, hey, man, once we're out here and we get that opportunity, you better not give us that opportunity because we will take it. And so far, they've been able to prove that going up a couple spaces as Kulavi drops down to the butt. Behind him closely, we have Le Bigre. So right there, too, the Frenchman and also a Team Red Line uh, we have him every now and then. He's such an amazing racer as well. So like we said, just our top five right here as uh, Jackson Senja is also sitting closely behind Le Bigre in that fifth place position. So the number 99 of Jackson Senja looking to come up on that Porsche of Le Bigre. But we have these drivers, of course, absolutely stacked. The three Brazilian, it looks like they may be teammates. They are all running the similar liveries uh, right there, fifth, sixth, seventh place. But man, so far, we're only two laps into this, but these two laps have shown these drivers just pushing it so far and a little bit, oh, to the inside. We have SNJ getting a little bit close. That could have been very ugly there, but he will still hold on to the same one as the Beager is able to defend him and fight him off. Well, you might be called Jackson. That move was almost too bad to execute. It was a really risky one from Jackson Resende. He sent one, and there's that spin. It is Jackson Resende. He's gone down at the source. A move that was almost about to be executed to perfection has gone all so wrong for Jackson Resende as he sent a big lunge on the inside of the bus stop, and then it all went haywire for him. That is a phenomenal position drop in a matter of one corner. And looking at the size of the quality of this win, if you drop it once, that is it. There's no way you're going to be climbing back up to the positions and the heights that you were once at. But let's drop that because there's another battle at the top to talk about. It is Tobias Soriano trying to make his way past on that BMW in a straight in a Porsche. Hard luck, buddy. That's not where the car is fastest. The corners, though, in this middle sector, that's where Soriano can really use his car's advantage to the fullest because at the end, it doesn't go to an as well as the Porsche. Meanwhile, there's more argy bargy racing going on in the background, and that would happen to be David Reno for Team FDRS in that BMW in the middle of all the fighting. Yeah, such an unfortunate incident earlier on there for Jackson Sanjay, who was looking to claw his way up into podium contention potentially but just like that that goes to show just you get some very close driving in here there's bound to be incidences like that happen and you know we may have to take a look at a replay later on just to see slow it down a bit exactly what happened there but again nonetheless right now we have Bierzbiski leading in first place in that Bilstein BMW uh, we can see there in the bottom right there Jackson SNJ the incident Looks like he went in a little hot. There may have been the slightest contact. It's hard to tell from the angle, but he went in very, very hot into that corner and just unfortunately spun out. That put him down almost all the way in last place. So very unfortunate incident there. But like we said, back to our leaders right now. We have Mears Bisky fighting off Soriano in the all matte black Porsche. Soriano looking absolutely menacing coming in he says hey letting him know we see a few peaks right here and we'll be able to see there's so many great overtaking opportunities in these cars especially once we slow it down a little 
We have such close racing as we go right here to turn one. Is he going to be? Nope, they're playing it very, very safe. Of course, right here, like you said. Right now, we're in lap four of eight. So we are roughly halfway through this 20-minute race. So anything can still happen as Soriano is still absolutely glued to the bumper of Birzbiski as they go through Eau Rouge. And let's not forget, this straight is one of the longest anywhere in the world. That BMW is by far and away the fastest car in a straight line. You saw, even though Soriano had a great run, how tricky it was for him to get past. But using the draft, it is doable. As Soriano has now proved, as he makes his way up into the lead. This is fantastic, because now for Nico Wierzbicki, he has to use the weaknesses of that BMW to his advantage, which is turning in, because in the middle sector, that Porsche theoretically should be quite good. And in terms of setups as well, there's not much flexibility in this championship anyway. So can he find time in the place where the BMW is just not as good? Because in the straights, he'll need a good run and then more to be able to get past Soriano. And by the way, if you're just looking at this race, if you've just walked in and are thinking, Aaron Vasquez in P11, what race am I watching? He qualified pretty high up, the reverse grid is in effect, where the top 15 get flipped around. So as it stands, if Vasquez stays where he is, he will be starting P... was it? Well, is my math very good? 1, 2, 3, P... P5 in the next heat. Well, I'm losing my head, it's what? 30 in the night in India, I'm just forgetting things all the way through. But yes, it's not about how bad he's driving, it's just the reverse grid that's putting him in that position right now. And again, right now, we are on board with Sanchez, who set the fastest time during qualifying, has now worked his way all the way back up into sixth place. So, on the starting grid, Sanchez went all the way down to 15th. Of course, we have top 15 drivers every single race getting that reverse grid. So, he's been able to claw his way back up to sixth place. So, Sanchez, a newer name that we haven't seen too much this season, is doing absolutely amazing. But like we said, when we look at Sanchez there, he does have a pro license, so he is absolutely no stranger to battling it out with some of these guys in here. Some of the best of the best racers showing up today for AMX 10 Season 4. But right now, again, he looks like he just set the fastest lap time right there. You can see on the timing, that purple time means that he set the fastest lap through there. So, Aaron, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, Aaron Vasquez, the other Spaniard, still in 10th place and also Sanchez. So, like we said, in qualifying, it was a 1-2 for Spain. Those guys, I don't know what it is, if there's something in the water out there in Spain that's turning out such fast drivers, but we love to see it. We love to see this battle as well going on with Kulavi and Florian Libigre. Of course, right here, still, these guys on that long stretch, Libigre getting able to get into that draft, catching up just a little bit, but we know Fourth place isn't good enough for him. He wants that podium position. He wants to get the win at the most, but at the very least, get on a podium position. As you can see right there in the bottom left as well, those drivers, absolute focus from both of those drivers battling now. So we will have to see who is going to come up fighting for that podium contention. Now, for some more context, drivers like Aaron Vasquez, Alejandro Sanchez, and all the other ones with bigger I ratings. They normally do lots of GD3s, GTs at times, cup cars here and there. GD4s are probably a bit lower down on their list of priority cars. Because in the other major championships, you don't quite tend to race these. It's only in the endurance ones, like your Nürburgring 24 hour special events, where the GT4s truly come out to show, and a few other independent championships here and there. But those championships aren't quite big enough to attract world championship level drivers, which means that when these drivers actually step into these cars, it's a big learning game for them to understand once more what the dynamics of these machines are like, to be able to then adapt back into it, and then to be able to compete against the specialists of these cars. This is what's making this race so much fun, because Tomas Soriano, sure, he walks in with quite a resume, but to be then seeing him fending off drivers like Nico Wojcicki or Merit, that makes it such a fun race. It's not done yet because we still have three more proper laps of Spa from the shop left to go in this seat. And then after that, a 15, a top 15 reverse grid race also coming up after this one as well. So there's more action coming up for all of us all the way through. And in terms of the big stories, guess what? 
Alejandro Sanchez is now in B6. His comeback story is turning out to be beautiful. Like you said, that's just an absolute great comeback scene there, as well as right now in the middle of the pack, like we mentioned earlier, middle of the pack is always somewhere you want to keep the cameras on, keep your eyes on, because that is where some of the best racing happens, some of the best battles. As you can see right now, Sanchez, who it looks like is a very consistent, him and Gael Valero, sector one, a little bit faster than Miranda, sectors two and three a little bit slower, sectors four and five a little bit faster so right there too as we can see right here going on the inside with a great beautiful pass there over Miranda so Sanchez they were door to door Sanchez able to just slip right in make sure that he holds on to that fifth place position he is already up 10 positions folks so right now that just shows being able to get up 10 positions through this entire grid but like we said, we're only six laps in of our eight lap race. So there's still plenty of time for anything to happen as Sanchez looking to get onto the podium position. We know he's trying to hunt down Florian Labigre in the fourth position as well. But again, Miranda just right on his bumper. So beautiful races, beautiful battles in between on the middle of the pack right here. Fifth place. I feel like we have this a lot. Whenever we have a focus going on, we have that picture in picture. It almost always seems like there's a fifth place battle at any point going on in an <laughs> AMX 10 race. <laughs> Absolutely, that's the kind of chaos we're used to seeing in this championship. But guys, do you want to see your head blown off immediately in confusion? I will do that anyway. So look at the timing screen if in case you haven't opened it up. But why Soriano right now has lapped faster in the first sector compared to Nico Wyszpinski. Now, why is that surprising, even though the margin is very limited? The reason is that Porsche is in the fastest car on that straight. And what is the most prominent part of that first sector at Spa? A long straight after Paul Rouge. So where can he be winning time? This corner, the exit of that bus stop chicane. We'll get to that in a second as we see a spin for Blaine, uh, Blaine up at the bus stop, which is such a, such a challenging corner to execute correctly while making a move. Coming back to the point, it's that exit of that bus stop chicane, it's that exit of this particular corner that you're seeing in the main picture right now, of course, and then the run to Lerd, then the run back down to Eau Rouge. It's surprising, because theoretically, BMW should not be slower than a Porsche over there, and in this coming lap, as you just seen right now, a BMW was a new partner than Soriano at the very top, but it's surprising how Tomas Soriano, even though he's in the Porsche, has been consistently racking up faster sector times than Bush Beats Street in a car that's theoretically slower on the straights just by nailing his exits or by capitalizing where Bush Beats is making minor errors. That gap has now come down, which means that a lead battle is going to be fun to watch in the last couple of laps. What Soriano is doing in the lead in that Porsche is nothing short of remarkable. He's technically dragging that car to its absolute limit and then beyond. It's a great drive. Absolutely. And right now, as we see, we are on board the number 22 of Nico Virbisky, who's looking to hunt down Soriano. But like we said, again, this is just showing of one, what is a better driver for, or what is a better car for that driver? So of course, style does come into play whenever you're on tracks like these that are very yep. balanced, that have some great straightaways, but some great overtaking sections into the corners. So right there too, even just the balance of front engine versus mid engine vehicles or rear engine in some of the Porsches. So just depending on the vehicle and the driving style, that makes a huge difference on here. And I can see, there in chat too of like yes we still do have Kulavi right now in third place so Kulavi's been holding on really great him and Fierce Bisky have been absolutely holding on to those podium positions all the way since we went green at the beginning of this race but right now we're still on board with Sanchez who was your fastest in qualifying and he is showing just why he was fastest in qualifying up 10 positions in the fifth place but looking on the rear bumper of the B grade so with little bit more than over a lap to go we are coming into lap seven of eight now so uh right now of course right here into the chicane these guys bumper to bumper all race long so it's been some great overtaking opportunities but it's been very very difficult for a lot of these drivers like we said now that we are wow. with the white flag flying 
we're going to have to see these guys step it up to try and get every single inch that they can get just those couple miles an hour more than the other drivers but now we are heading in to some of the best racing final lap lap number eight of eight here in our heat one alejandro sanchez has just blown my mind in this last lap he has clocked in a 2 minute 27.4 for context no other driver is within four tenths of a second of that last time in the entire race it blows my mind actually there's only one driver within that gap there's one driver three tenths behind him and it's the man in p17 Daxon Resende Alejandro Sanchez is one of only four actually let me do my math very quickly I think one of only four drivers in that two minute 27 lap time and nobody is within three tenths of a second of his pace he desperately needs to pass the big grid right now as someone in the chat has also mentioned because a more prize money and b pride eventually now although that would mean that he gets a position down in that second race that will come up immediately after this one it will mean a lot more prize money and a lot of alejandro sanchez and watch his mclaren watch the behavior watch the body language of that car nobody sends around the outside unless they're that confident but alejandro sanchez is one confident man around the outside he goes to Florian Lebigre and that's it Sanchez is up in the P4 he's moved up 11 positions in this race and that McLaren is going places man that is absolutely amazing driving right there from Sanchez showing why he is just one of the best as well as they're rocking the Apex team livery Apex also very proud of him along with his teammate Kyle Valero who is only a couple places back behind him so like we said these guys they are just absolutely insane whenever you put this into perspective from iRacing standards they're the best of the best I mean there's just really no other way to put that that these guys are some of the best of the best we have as well as some of the guys that are not racing here today that we know it's always great as we have across the checkered flag Soriano Virzbiski and Kulavi, your top three. Soriano able to hold it off finally against Virzbiski and get that $30 plus first place into heat number one. As we have the rest of the drivers now coming across, we have the likes of Nixon, Docarmo. Looks like we had Juan Blaynot, Tim State out of the race, Gvoc back in the pit. So such close racing the entire time man that was just absolutely amazing like we said with a stacked grid like this you never know what's going to happen well one thing you can expect is these drivers to be bumper to bumper all race and sanchez with the fastest lap but right now we have your ben q session winner was Tobias soriano hitting that first place position followed by second place nico demvirsbiski Third place, Gaston Kulavi. In fourth, Alejandro Sanchez. Fifth place, or Florian Lebigre. Sixth, Victor Miranda. Seventh place, Bruno De Carmo. Eighth place, Gael Valero. Ninth, Aaron Vasquez. Tenth, Dino Felipa. Eleventh, Martin Chico. Twelfth place, we have Roman Pascucci. Pedro Dean coming in in thirteenth place. Rounding into fourteenth, we have Fabio Zamperlini. Fifteenth place, Hero Encinas. Sixteenth, Maxi Aru. Seventeenth, Jackson is NJ 18th, Daniel Reno. Keep in mind, again, when we go into see the heat number two, it will only be the top 15. So we will be seeing Aero and Sinas be in that pole position, as well as Tobias Serrano getting back to the back of the pack a little bit. But as we continue on there, you can see 19th, Connor Nixon, 20, Fabio De Carmo, 21st, Juan Blay, not David Givak in 22nd, Tim State 23rd, and Josh Perwain down in 24th. So we had a little bit of incidences there. Those last few drivers looked like they were out of the races into the pits a little bit earlier than they hoped. But right now, speaking of another Need for Speed livery, we had the BMW earlier from Need for Speed Most Wanted. We have another Need for Speed Most Wanted car up there towards the front of the pack in the Porsche. Let's go then. Reverse grid, top 15 swapped around. Another race at Spa is coming up for us. This should be a fun one, Kevin. Oh, we're already seeing pumping in the background before the green flag goes around. 
Oh, I know that those drivers are going to have words after the race as we go. Green flags flying, and these drivers are already getting super intense. Chaos at turn one. Like it has to be. Oh, that looks like it was Zamperlini, unfortunately, coming out with the bad end of that deal, and he puts him down all the way near the end of the row. Man, that is such an unfortunate incident there, as we have right now. Sanchez in the middle of the pack, and Cena still up first. Chico and Dean battling it out towards the front of the pack. So right now we're going too wide down the straightaway. Right here, this could be dangerous. It's always a little bit dangerous, even though we're in these GT4 cars. But right now, two, potentially three wide going down the corner. But it looks like we do have Encinas able to hold on to that first no! place. And another incident. No! Oh, well, it's all gone wrong for Florian Lebigre in that Porsche. He is down and out in P20. The wi well, not the winner, actually. One of your top drivers in the last heat finds himself stuck to the bottom of the timing speed, which is such a bitter disappointment considering his talent but there are more stories to talk about Aaron Vasquez is already up in the P2 he will be a shark hunting for more and there's another spinner in the background what is going on today so many cars out Kevin this has to be one of the most chaotic AMX stars I have ever seen honestly yeah there's a lot of drivers there that they seen from the heat number one I guess they weren't too happy with some of their finishing positions or some of the drivers that were up front that ended up having to get that reverse grid get back several positions but again like we said these drivers they know they're hungry they seen exactly what these drivers are capable of these guys are a little bit more comfortable with the track being in all of this traffic going on so with that heat number two it always heats up just a little bit more than the first race so of course these drivers first lap incidences are almost always bound to happen when we have the absolute aggression being shown by these drivers Ooh. but there's we can see there's still some side-by-side -side racing going on in the back going too wide right there so we'll have to see that looks like Gael Valero and Piers Bisky along with Soriano so three drivers right there going super wide along into the home stretch but right there man as we finish lap one already a few incidences a few drivers going up that made especially with Aaron Vasquez now who is able to go up five positions looking like he's going to get a podium contention he's in that podium position for second so we'll see if he can hold on to that as Gael Valero still not gained or lost any positions this heat is still looking to climb his way up but right now it is Encinas Vasquez Felipe your top three looking to battle it out as these guys all in the Porsches as well so equal cars but it will just be a battle of which driver wants it most which driver makes the least amount of mistakes and things are getting dicey things are really getting dicey Aaron Vasquez desperately wants to move up into P1 he knows that he has more pace than Gero and Sinas. he showcased that in the last race and that by all means is no disrespect to Encinas. It's just that Aaron Vasquez in the last race was on another planet clocking in lap times that were in the 2 minute 27s. So for him, you can tell that there's more potential waiting in that car. It's just a matter of getting past cleanly. A small matter of getting past cleanly. With so many drivers have already failed at doing in this race so far. So for Vasquez, patience. Hold your nerves, buddy. You might be young, you might be exciting. Can you take a deep breath? and wait for the right moment to get past, which I get a feeling might just be now. It isn't because the best run possible wasn't quite available for Vasquez as he waits for the right opportunity. He's a young kid, but he's waiting for that move at the right time. And that's a good, good sign. But in the background, Bruno De Camo, Victor Miranda, uh, and we also have Alejandro Sanchez, Nico Vesbitsky and Gal Valero, along with Tobias Soriano, all packed up. Oh wait, actually Gaston Kulhabi is also in that pack, all within a second and a half of each other. Man, what's, what have we done to deserve racing as good as this? This is insane considering the talent of this field. And as things are just heating up right there towards the front of it, absolutely. It looks like Aaron Vasquez right now looking to make his move on Encina. So Aaron Vasquez going for the inside. Will he be able to come out of it? No. He is going and around the outside. And he also has Felipe right there behind him. So right there, 
everyone able to hold their place as they go into the home stretch. But right now, we're going into lap three of eight. And it looks like Sanchez is still setting the fastest lap. So Sanchez is climbing through the ranks as well. So this battle going on in the front, if these guys start slowing down each other, that'll leave plenty of room for the middle of the pack to catch back up. And what could be a three-way battle on the podium start turning into a four-way battle, a five-way battle. So again, that just goes that may be possibly why we've seen so many p5 battles all season long is you have one battle going on for the lead one battle going on a little bit back but nonetheless all of these drivers just absolutely insanely fast we can see right here aaron vasquez is able to get the draft going on the inside right now so he's able to make that pass on oh and seen us with the cut back so <laughs> sorry about that so right that that just goes to show the draft and the straightaway a little bit of cutting in, a little bit of back. So it's seen us doing an amazing job defending your current points leader, Aaron Vasquez. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. You don't have to be the fastest car to win the race. And Chinas was, what, three tenths of a second slower than Vasquez in that last lap? Admittedly, that is the case. Fair enough. You might not have as much raw pace as the young 16-year-old who's setting the sim racing world on fire. Hands up, admit it and move on. What can you do instead? You can drive like the man on which you've based your livery upon. Bull! Blacklist number two on NFS Most Wanted. Drive like that and defend as hard as he does and you might just end up winning this race. This is brilliant from Encinas. He's blocking the lines off so well and he's making Vasquez work for it. He's realizing that being a young driver, patience might probably not be on the top of the list of skills developed right now. And you can tell by the way Vasquez is putting his car down. But Encinas is blocking those lines so smartly, especially the one coming up rather soon at the bus stop so that Vasquez is now having to figure out other ways of passing him which just aren't working out as well. Bring it on this! This battle is what we want sim racing for. Drivers using their stress to their advantage and now we see a bit of a tap. This is getting too spicy to handle now, Kevin. Oh, oh. And right there, yep, we see in which Air Vasquez who looked like he was waiting patiently so now able to get into that first place position as he passes Encinas so Encinas was doing an amazing job of defending him but right now lap four Aaron Vasquez able to finally get into that first place position and if this is anything like the races we've seen as it looks like oh, a little bit of a peak on the inside from Encinas again so Vasquez going a little bit wide not wanting to have any contact there so we'll have to see of course Aaron Vasquez being a little bit faster than Encinas just la laying down those amazing lap times so far one thing we've seen all season long, and we will have to see here in heat number two if he continues to do it. Once Aaron Vasquez is able to get that clean air into P1, he is able to just take off with the win. So we will have to see as he already has over a half a second gap. But Aaron Vasquez over Felipe. So Encinas now falling back all the way down to fourth place. So unfortunately for Encinas, falling back more than just the one position from first place. But we're going side by side here, so it's getting a little bit dicey in the middle of the pack. He ain't a pushover, but he has been pushed aside. That's been the case of Encinas right now. And Alejandro Sanchez starts to make his mark on this race. He must have been P12 at the start. He now finds himself in P3 in that McLaren. And there's only a couple of people who can challenge Alan Vasquez with that sort of pace in this race. One of those names is Alejandro Sanchez and he's coming in hot and fast in that McLaren back down in P3. But he's not the only one. Kyle Valero is coming in fast. Nico Wojtwicki is also talking with the bridge to the lap times. And during the combo, he's not being pushed over at all. His eye rating might not be able to compare with all the others. But this guy has some proper guts for sticking where he is. But something's going wrong. Wojtwicki and Valero are dropping down on timing screens. Have we seen a crash? And we're going to have to see there, going, exactly what happened. Okay. There looks like a bunch of drivers are now showing out of the race. So we'll have to see if there was a bit of a glitch going on there, if there was a crash. So like you said, we're going to have to just wait and see exactly what was happening. But that that changed up the entire grid. As we can now see Connor Nixon, I just see him going up, 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 up on the screen. Givok up 15 places. Aruz up 10 places. Gulavi is now eight places up from the start. So man, these guys, wow, just an amazing turn of events here halfway through our race 
So like we said, we're going to have to see exactly what happened back there. But nonetheless, that leaves Aaron Vasquez still in the lead by about half a second over Dino Filippa. And we have Lucarmo now in that third place, followed by, it looks like his teammate, Victor Miranda. Again, right there, those guys, they look like they are uh, on the same team. I, I noticed earlier again, uh, Texco Race by Tony Kanan. Tony Kanan, one of the most amazing drivers that there has been. I know him from being in the States and from some of the IndyCar races. But he is known for much more than that. So yeah, we'll have to see. I see chat there too, asking about a timing error. We're gonna have to wait and see exactly what happened when the entire grid shifted. But one thing we do know for sure, Aaron Vasquez leading Dino Filippa. Dino Filippa though, 0.3 seconds. So do not count him out. These two were battling it on earlier. So they do have a gap though. First and second starting to walk away a little bit from that third place position. So we'll have to see. Battle for first ensues as well as a battle for third place. Now, what we have seen completely changes the dynamic of this race. We have seen so many top drivers like Gal Valero, Tobias Soriano, Nico Vizbitsky, Alejandro Sanchez. All of them drop out. We'll not talk about how that happened because we have no idea of how that happened. So let's focus on what could happen from here. And what could clearly happen from here is a masterclass of one of our favorite drivers in this series, Gaston Kulhavi. E5 right now, he's clocking in some really decent lap times, but lap times that are just not as good as the drivers ahead of him, even though their eye rating is far, far better. So what's happening here? Victor Miranda is putting in a proper shift. He's really making that car work in P4, but he's got to do more because there's a bit of a gap that's emerged between Miranda and Bruno de Carmo, and then the strain that you're seeing at the top of this grid between Aaron Vasquez and Dino Filippa. And fair play to Dino Filippa. Has he been the most consistent driver on this grid? Probably not. Has he won the most races? Probably not. Is he as good in terms of high rating? Compared to Aaron Vasquez, there's a marginal difference, but he's keeping up and he's keeping up so, so well. He might only rank somewhere in the mid back of the overall championship standings, but that will really hide the quality of a driver that he is. And watching his driving so far, he's been around so many chaotic battles in this race. It's the only one who has not made a single error and has been clean all the way through. In a Felipe, you have an opportunity, my friend. Grab it with both hands. This win could be yours. And of course, we can still see uh, about a quarter of the grid there out on the timing screen. So it looks like we got word uh, from some of the producers that there was quite a bit of these guys out of the race. Looks like, unfortunately, some technical issues with iRacing, which it just, you, you hate to see. You always want to see the best drivers having the best races. But again, we'll have to see uh, if that plays into the overall points with the championship. And again, with the racing stewards having to review the rules, you know, we try to prepare for anything, be ready for anything to happen within the regulations. Of course, it's not being in person. There's bound to be technical issues that you wouldn't face the same as if we were out here on the track in real life. But like yeah. I said, it is unfortunate for some drivers, but other drivers are still in the race, so we will keep seeing what is going on there as Aaron Vasquez continues to fight off Dino Filippa. And Dino Filippa is doing something really special here. His last lap time, believe it or not, was in the same thousandth of a second as that of Aaron Vasquez. That takes some doing. And Dino Filippa, let's talk about where he was faster or where he was slower. Slightly faster in sector one, getting a better run, similar in, in also in sector two. Sector three, man, that is where we are seeing Aaron Vasquez pull a little bit of time. They are almost equally matched, which then begs, to, begs the question, where can he find the pace? Where can he pass him? If they are so similar almost everywhere, can Dino Filippa find that one point of advantage at one point of the circuit? Maybe using the split screen and the run to make a move at Lecom. By the way, Aaron Vasquez might be young, but he'll also be aware of all those opportunities as well. So what we're going to get to see here is going to be a proper game of chess with both drivers knowing each other's best possible moves. Can they still then go out there and make it happen and get one up over their rivals? Or oh, this battle in the next couple of laps is going to be one to relish. There we can see, getting back into things, of course, 
Aaron Vasquez, Dino Felipe, I expect this battle to go on all the way until we hit the checkered flag. Felipe gaining some time, but again, Vasquez, this is why he has been in the lead so far this season. This is why he's one of the best drivers on the iRacing platform, because it is not just about being the fastest, as we can see Felipe obviously right there being a little bit faster through some of the sectors, but it is a just masterclass in racecraft. The way that Aaron Vasquez is able to defend Felipe, just not giving him any room to make a pass. So of course, like you said, we've been saying it all day long. We've seen AMX1 and AMX10. It's not always about who the fastest driver is. A lot of this goes into the racecraft. A lot of it goes into strategy. And as we can see, there's still, the gap is growing now about a four second gap between second and third place so looks like we'll be having two battles on our hands once we start going to that final lap and as is seen all season long this seems to be an occurrence great battles up front great battles in the middle sometimes even great battles Ooh. in the rear as we can see now whoa a little bit of a getting a little aggressive there these guys know that they only have a little bit more than one lap left and uh it's great to see some of the drivers that did disconnect are now back in the race so they will still, unfortunately, not be where they would like to be, but they are still now in the race. But again, on board, Dino Felipe, can he make a move? We will have to wait and see. But Vasquez does not have the momentum quite like he did a couple of laps ago. Felipe clearly is carrying more pace in that car. In fact, he went faster off lap compared to Vasquez, only by a bit. But when the gaps and the margins are so tight, even a little bit, like five hundredths of a second, matters so much. Because now, when you watch that exit, you will hopefully, at least for Felipe, be looking at a great run, which can then result in a pass at the bus stop. That hasn't quite happened. So where can Felipe find the gap? Where can he find the pace? Where can he find that little bit extra so that he can make that move up ahead over Aaron Vasquez? And this is where the road reversed. Vasquez does not have to be the fastest. Remember, in that first race, Soriano was not the fastest either, but he held on quite well from the lead, and that's what he had to do precisely. Look at what they're doing, almost tapping into each other at the bus stop. This final lap will be one to watch for. There's barely anything to split Vasquez and Dino Felipe as they come to one last strip of the Spa Franco shop. Where can the difference lie? Is track position going to ultimately be the crowning glory thing of this race. Can Philippe dig deep and maybe use that one slight run on the top of Eau Rouge to get past Vasquez? Not too long until we find our answer. Of course, and now Vasquez able to just get a little bit of breathing room between him and Philippe. But like we said right here down this back straight, Philippe able to stay in the draft. So this... Uh, Aaron Vasquez able to get a little bit of a gap going, but no, that draft always just able to reel him back in. So now Felipe will be putting everything on the line as he tries to overtake Vasquez. So we will see. He's waiting patiently because he knows, like we said, we're on the final lap of the race. It's now or never. So it's all or nothing going into this last lap. But at the same time, these drivers, they're confident enough. They are skilled enough to know, hey, I'm going to push it to the absolute limit, but I know where my limit needs to lie because I do not want to push it so much where right there it looks like Felipe going a little bit wide. So again, Aaron Vasquez first place, Dino Felipe shortly behind as we are almost all the way through our second heat. We're a little bit over through the halfway point in this final lap. Aaron Vasquez potentially winning this race and potentially winning the entire rear wheel drive class for AMX 10. I thought that could have been it. I really did. When I saw Dino Felipe go around the outside of the no name corner and into the into the AstroTurf, I thought that is it. But no, he has a run. Will he send one on the inside of the bus stop? Chicane? There's only one more opportunity left now, Kevin for anything to work out. It seems like Vasquez has it covered, but don't count draft count heading into the bus stop. Felipe is closer than ever. This is going to be a really fun last couple of corners. Here we go. Of course, right here. So we have Dino Felipe looking to the outside. So we'll be able to get as, ooh, great job defending right there from Aaron Vasquez as they go into the final stretch. So right here, it will be a drag no race to the end. And it looks like Vasquez cheering he knows it 
He has won heat number two. <laughs> Basque is so excited after that. You see him right there in the bottom left, relieved and excited at the same time. But a great run as well from Dino Filippa, able to hold it off into the last turn. But unfortunately, only coming away with that second place and not first place like he wanted to. Victor Miranda also on podium contention coming into third place. And wow. Man, we knew that it was going to be some great battles and a tight race towards the checkered flag, but we didn't know it was going to be that good of a battle all the way through. Congratulations to Aaron Vasquez, able to win your heat number two of race 30 AMX season 10, or sorry, AMX season four, AMX 10 racing. <laughs> I'm at a loss of words. <laughs> what can I say? I'm I'm at a loss of words after that. It's been great finishes like that all season long. So we will have to see what the official results are coming up here in a few minutes. But until then, great racing heat number one, great racing heat number two. We had a stacked grid from the very beginning. And we'll have to see what some of these drivers have to say about it coming up. Uh, so Mil, what a great day to be commentating. Absolutely. There's no other way to put it. The racing that we've seen so far in both classes has been incredible in its own right. In the NASCAR class in the MX1, we saw a very technical battle, one that revolved around tire wear and strategy. But in AMX10, it was proper, clean, hardcore racing. Can you be the fastest driver at one of the toughest circuits in the world, at one of the most dicey, in one of the most dicey cars around in the iRacing service? Great racing at the end. A little bit of a shame that we had that iRacing issue eventually and again it's very easy to blame iRacing for all these things but remember they're putting up such an incredible service so a few issues here and there can happen but at the end we've got to applaud some incredible driving and in that second heat the best driver out there well it had to be Aaron Vasquez but only by just because Dino Filippo was not too far off and his driving was commendable so, of course, as we can see on screen right now, your Ben Q Session winner, Aaron Vasquez, putting up a great fight. And second place, Dino Filippo, who was so close, but just couldn't get past Aaron Vasquez. Third place, we have Victor Miranda, who actually came up quite a few places to get a podium for that heat number two, doing an amazing job. Fourth place, Bruno De Carmo. In fifth place, we have Gaston Kulavi. Sixth place, we have David Givok. Seventh, Hero Encinas. Eighth place, Connor Nixon. Ninth, Maxi Aruz. Tenth place, Jackson SNJ. Eleventh, Martin Chico. Twelfth place, Florian Lebigre, who also set your fastest lap for heat number two. In 13th place, we have Daniel Moreno. 14th, Tim State. 15th, Fabio Zamperlini. 16th place, Alejandro Sanchez, who again was having such a great run until that incident happened during heat number two. 17th place, Gael Valero. 18th, Nikodem Virzbiski. Again, like we see some of these drivers down here on the bottom, such an unfortunate thing going on, but that is part of racing for some of these drivers that, uh, again, we'll, uh, we'll see what they have to say here in a couple minutes in the interview. But man, that is just uh, great racing overall. Congratulations to everyone. And again, we have one week left here for your rear wheel drive in AMX 10 races, as well as races coming up tomorrow. But before we get to that, wow, like I said, I feel like I'm speechless after every single AMX 10 race. Uh, even though it is my job to be able to find the words, there's just sometimes that those words escape you. Just great battles, great finishes. And so, Mil, again, we'll have to hear what these drivers have to say in a few minutes about today's race. But I want to hear, overall, what was, what was your highlight of the race before we get into our interviews? For me, wow, that's a, that's a tough one, actually, because there's so many good ones to pick from. But uh, I'd say... I'd say the majority of, uh, of that we saw with Alex, uh, with, with Vasquez at the end, because as a 16 year old, to be able to hold off someone like Dino Felipe was giving it his best and technically driving that car to its very limit. That takes a lot and that takes experience beyond your years. And that was for me a great moment to watch. And it'll be interesting to know if we can get him on what exactly was going through his head. But that for me was such an incredible moment. And to see it in action and to see battles of this quality till the very end in both of these races, wow, that, that does leave you speechless, honestly. 
Absolutely. So, in here too, like we said, we have our driver interviews coming up very shortly. So, of course, one of the people that uh, we've seen had been here from the very beginning. We hadn't seen in quite a while, but he was back today. And that was Alex Sanchez. Also, you see on the screen, I believe his uh, name on screen was Alejandro Sanchez. So, Alejandro, Alex, how he may be known, one of these drivers that is just an absolute unit out here absolutely amazing top tier driver setting some top tier laps out here so we will be hearing from him here in very shortly alejandro can you hear me hello ah, there you are yeah. There you are. Firstly, mate, I have to say what a comeback you had in that first race. L let's talk about that before we go to what happened in the second one because you're driving in the first race. What, what did you eat, man? Your lap times, 227s and going in 3, 4, 10s faster than everyone else. That was really good to watch. Yeah, I think uh, the McLaren was quite fast, to be honest. And there was not so many McLarens, so that off quite well and the draft was super strong as well so it was just a matter of timing the the gaps better than everyone else and just making sure that you could overtake um in a safe manner in the after a rush so yeah that's what i did and yeah it was a lot of fun of course my first time here and for sure i will repeat and yeah had a lot of fun in the first race of course <clears throat> quite quite helpful to have to have my teammate uh, jb gael on um on the race uh, he helped me a lot in quali as well so yeah big thanks to him and about the second race alejandro what what exactly happened according to you what, what did you see while you dropped down uh just, it was just um five of us disconnecting or something like that and yeah my screen just froze and the sound and everything just froze as well and the force feedback was stuck to the left side as well it was all on the same place as well so it was yeah some something i racing needs to solve um, it's a known issue since the last patch, but it's the first time it's happened to me. Of course, quite unfortunate because I was running P3 at the time and catching up to the top two. So yeah, um, quite a shame really. I started P12, I think, and I was P3 by then, so quite a nice comeback, but I race and had other plans. So yeah, stuff like this happens. Uh, I think it's the first time in, well, two years that I've had a hardware failure, I guess you could call it that uh, this one but yeah i had fun in the meanwhile so can't complain too much but let's end on the positives what did you think of the competition because we loved watching you race we loved how at least in the first one the battles on the outside looked like they were very respectful do you like uh, the competition that we saw on this yeah that's what i like the most like the competition being respectful is something you don't really see nowadays in sim racing and it's something that it's quite enjoyable in the format as well it doesn't promote like sweating 30 hours of practice or just trains of teammates or whatever uh, it's just everyone driving for themselves and respecting each other so it had quite a lot of fun to be honest uh, i will repeat for sure You're incredible alejandro a really unfortunate about the second race but great to see you race thank you very much yeah. thank you very much As we can see there, speaking with Alejandro, of course, man, that was just an unfortunate result there in the second heat. So we'll still have to see from our officials exactly what happened there and moving forward, um, exactly how that is going to play out for the heat number two. But again, it's always great to speak with our drivers after every single uh, AMX 10 race. And with this, like we said, there's one week left, but as it stands, for the rear-wheel drive class, of course, we knew Aaron Vasquez was going into this leading with quite a significant lead. He didn't quite have enough points going into today to be crowned the champion. But after today, again, we'll have to see what the official results are. But after today's races, we may, be, we may very well be seeing a new champion for Season 4 of AMX 10. Of course, being our rear-wheel drive class. But again... We're going to wait until we get the official results from our racing stewards. Um, we don't want to 
have anything preemptively, but it's looking very promising for Aaron Vasquez. Again, he did amazing for heat number two. So, so Mila, you said he was your he was your absolute highlight of the race, especially everyone knows him, I racing up and coming. And we'll have to see. Of course, I would not be surprised if Aaron Vasquez takes that leap from being one of the top I racers into being one of these top drivers in real life as well. Again, he's very young. He has a very bright future ahead of him. So we'll have to wait and see as well as all of these drivers today did very good job. Yeah, and Dino Filippo was quite good as well. I, I love watching that. Alejandro Sanchez was so much fun to watch in the middle. But it's it's that Brazilian contingent. We had Bruno de Camo do so well. Victor Miranda was also so incredible. And their pace was probably a few tenths away from that of the other competition. But the intensity with which they fought, ah, that is what you need in the race. And a lot of it, very, very respectful. Even though they were probably not in the fastest cars on the entire grid. They were in the Aston Martins, which didn't perform as well as the Porsches or the McLarens did as well. So it, it was nice to see that. And it's a regular feature now of all these AMX 10 races that we get to see these three, four drivers coming in very often. Also Chico in the mix as well. He also tends to pop by quite often and makes it very, very interesting. So I like that even though we have a crop of World Championship and A license level I rating drivers, there are other drivers in the middle who will just pop by and be very regular in the AMX Championship that they get to fight shoulder to shoulder actually with some of the best on the planet what this series really brings together. A really unlikely combination because these drivers, you probably won't see them racing each other in a PESC or any other major championship. But here, here you can test your mettle and find out if you're actually good enough to be with them. And that was such a lovely sight to see. Absolutely. Always a great time here for AMX 10. So, great races this morning. Oh, my time this morning, evening, other places in the world. Um, <laughs> But great races nonetheless with AMX1 and AMX10. So again, make sure everyone follow on all of the socials. They are on screen right now. And we will be back tomorrow with some more AMX action. So make sure to come back tomorrow. We will be live streaming Twitch, YouTube as always. And signing off for today's races, I am Kevin here with Somil. We'll see you next time. <laughs>